American League in the World Series. This is where baseball dreams are born. The deep history between these two clubs is clear, and the rivalry remains rich. Boston has survived the better part of this century trying to heal from their deep baseball wounds. Deep the left, it's a home run! And the Red Sox have watched their rivals win the World Series 24 times. But this 1999 Boston club took a powerful Cleveland club and cruelly dismantled it in five games, leading this bunch to believe they belonged with baseball's best. Now they face the Yankees, the New York Yankees, with a chance at redemption, a precious chance to change history. On October 13, 1999, baseball will be like it should be. It's game one between the Boston Red Sox and the New York Yankees, only on Fox. The night in the borough of the Bronx, New York City, New York, is blustery, warm, and historic. Since before the subways and L's even extended this far uptown, since where the number four train unloads the faithful was farmland, Boston and New York have pounded each other with blows to the ribs. Tonight, one of the Warriors here plays despite a fractured rib. Paul O'Neill is here despite the latest family crisis, the struggle for his family's father's health. Orlando Hernandez is here, symbolic of the struggles to reach these shores, the freedom they represent, and the right to keep your age a secret. And these teams are here, the oldest rivals in American sports, who play still in the cities in which they were created, a monument to baseball's past, and in that they are meeting for the first time after 97 years in the postseason, a monument, too, to baseball's future. From Yankee Stadium in New York, it's game one of the American League Championship Series with Joe Buck, Tim McCarver, and Bob Brenly standing by for the play-by-play, -play. and alongside Steve Lyons, I'm Keith Olbermann. 97 years ago today, the ancestors of these Boston Red Sox won the first modern World Series. Their rivalry with the New York Highlanders, even then often nicknamed the Yankees, was already underway. More on that in a moment. First to my partner, Steve Lyons, and the guts of a current Yankee hero, Paul O'Neill, playing and playing tonight through physical and emotional pain. And Paul O'Neill is probably the emotional leader of this team. He's got that cracked rib. He's going to go out there and play anyway. He wanted to let everybody know that he did not beg his way into the lineup. He was in the lineup all the time. He was only not going to be in it if he wasn't well enough to play. But they did make some roster moves because of it. Shane Spencer on the roster. Jim Leritz, Mr. October number two, off the roster. Spencer can play in the outfield if, in fact, O'Neill dies for a ball and re-injures himself and can't go. The starting pitchers in the game, and in fact in this series, reflect the different routes these teams have taken here. The Yankees' rotation has been manicured, sculptured, to get Orlando Hernandez going today against Kent Merker and David Cohn going tomorrow. And it's kind of like Jimmy Williams looks down his bench and says, uh, which one of you guys is the pitcher again? Yeah, you know, the Red Sox didn't have the luxury of being able to set their rotation like the Yankees did because of the three-game sweep. But I like the fact that Jimmy Williams is going to go with Kent Merker in game number one because he's the left-hander. You throw the left-hander here in Yankee Stadium where the left field's a little bit bigger. If you throw him in Fenway Park, that green monster looms. If you can't get the ball in on guys, they just tattoo that wall, and sometimes they hit it over it. Earlier today, the other thing that is floating around this city, apart from the Red Sox and the Yankees, the possibility of the Mets and the Yankees in a Subway Series took another step further away from happening. The uh, Braves and Mets, and the Mets trying to tie up the Braves in Atlanta. Uh, the highlights, uh, as you uh, may have heard the result already, the Yank Mets were leading this game two to nothing and uh, lost it four to three at, at the final as John Smoltz closed it out. And Eddie Perez with a big home run in that game. We talked about how role players would make a big role in the playoffs, and so far they have been doing that. All right, we, we were talking about the, about how the Red Sox and the Yankees matched up in terms of uh, getting here, and the Yankees having almost a roadmap, the Red Sox wandering through. Absolutely, totally different pass, and I gotta tell you, the Yankees clearly are supposed to win this series, but it doesn't always work that way. I think right now the Yankees would rather face any team in baseball except the Red Sox because they're so hot, and they're really emotionally charged up for this series. The Yankees, if you remember, just waltzed through the Texas series, Daryl Strawberry, a lot of people think he might sh should be in the big house, but he was hitting big three-run homers. El Duque, the number one starter now, he was on fire. Bernie Williams, maybe the most complete player in the American League. And Roger Clemens showing everybody why pitching and defense is what got the Yankees to this next series, the American League Championship Series. For the Red Sox, John Ballantyne could have buried himself with that Game 1 error. He came up huge with seven RBIs in Game 4. And then the same thing about Tro Troy O'Leary with two big home runs in Game 5 after being walked 
in front of him, Nomar Garcia Parra. They walked him twice to get to O'Leary. He was two for 16 coming into that game, and he came up huge. And then who can forget Pedro Martinez? Six innings of no-hit baseball after not even supposed to being out there on the mound. So when you look at this series, would you say that the Yankees are supposed to win? Yes. Will that necessarily happen? Not necessarily when you're playing against a team that is as scrappy and as hot as the Red Sox are now. All right, we approach game time for the Yankees. This series begins in the hands of the man who may be the new ace of their staff. Orlando Hernandez, 30 years old this Monday, or 35, whatever. Stand by, more in a moment. From Yankee Stadium, first pitch with one of the first pitchers, Kent Merker, for the Red Sox. Of uh, Game One, Yankees Red Sox minutes away, and Boston versus New York would be enough if it were just the 97 years of these two teams at war, perpetually, perennially. But this is also Celtics versus Knicks, Bruins versus Rangers, Harvard versus Columbia, John Adams versus Robert Livingston and Lewis Morris at the Continental Congress. Boston hates New York, and vice versa. And Yankees Sox is the ultimate expression of that wonderful hate. The camera highlights in the world of sports. It all started with Jack Cheeseboro, a ninth inning wild pitch by the man who still holds the 20th century record with 41 wins in a season gave Boston, they were the Pilgrims then, the pennant over New York, they were the Highlanders then, in 1904. Since Babe Ruth and four other Hall of Famers like Herb Pennock went from the Sox to the Yanks, the battle has been mostly in the stands, not on the field. It was more about individual accomplishments. Dimaggio's 56-game hitting streak versus Teddy Ballgame's 406. By the time Boston was back in 1967, the Yanks were in the basement. But that spring, they did manage to have such a brawl on the field that the police had to break it up. And that's at the core. A fight on the field or in the stands on occasion, but more often a fight of personality. Less Clantons versus Earps, more Republicans versus Democrats. Who was better, Williams or DiMaggio? Johnny Pesky or Phil Rizzuto? Billy Martin or Jimmy Pearsall? Carlton Fisk or Thurman Munson? Sparky Lyle or Danny Cater? The rivalry really reached the standings only in the 70s. From 72 through 77, the Yanks were 14 and 38 at Fenway Park. The Sox knocked New York out of the pennant race in 73 and 74, and behind Lynn and Rice, they went to the World Series in 75. Then the pendulum swung back, starting with the Bill Lee fight the spring they reopened Yankee Stadium, escalating through the Boston Massacre. 42 Yankee runs in four games at Fenway 21 years ago last month. Then the only time till now that the teams have actually met after the regular season. Hit high in the air to left field. Going to the corner, Yastrzemski. It's over the wall. It's a home run for Buckingham. What amplified the rivalry there, of course, was that Mike Torres, the pitcher, had been a Yankee, just as Lyle had been a Red Sox, and Yastrzemski was from Long Island, and even good old Jack Cheeseboro was from North Adams, Mass. And didn't these guys, Ruth and Clemens, pitch for Boston? Merker and Hernandez are next on the mound. Joe Buck, Tim McCarver, and Bob Brenly are next in the booth. For Steve Lyons, I'm Keith Olbermann. We'll report to you throughout from the dugouts. In a moment, please let us take you out to the ball game. League Championship Series tonight. It's the world champion New York Yankees taking on their rival, the Boston Red Sox. And welcome to the broadcast booth, everyone. I'm Joe Bach, along with my partners, Tim McCarver and Bob Brenly. We start by looking at the pitching matchup for this game one, and we turn to the world champions and to Tim McCarver, and let's hear more about the right-hander, El Duque Orlando Hernandez. Well, Joe, it's one of the great recent stories in baseball. Less than two years ago, this guy was making $8 a month in Cuba. After defecting and signing with the Yankees, he joined New York last June 3rd and has been the most consistent starter since. Among the five starters with the Yankees, you have to keep in mind, they have a future Hall of Famer in Roger Clemens. They have a guy who pitched a perfect game this year in David Cohn. And yet for the second time in this postseason, Joe Torre's elected to go to El Duque to start the series. Yeah, well, Joe Torre had a choice. He elected to go with Orlando Hernandez. Not much of a choice for the Boston Red Sox. They had to use their ace, Pedro Martinez, in game five of the division series in their win against Cleveland. So they are left with Kent Merker in game one. 
Ken Merker, the only left-handed starter in the rotation for the Red Sox this year. Two months ago, he was pitching for the Cardinals. This will be the first time Ken Merker has ever taken the hill here at Yankee Stadium, and this is a man that's plagued with control problems this year. In an inning and two-thirds against Cleveland in the division series, he walked three batters. If he's having trouble with his control tonight, it could be a very short evening for Ken Merker. One of the classic rivalries in all of sports, the Red Sox and the Yankees meet for the first time in postseason history. Buckle up. ALCS Game 1 coming your way next from Yankee Stadium. The 1999 American League Championship Series on Fox is brought to you by Brewery Fresh Budweiser, official beer of Major League Baseball. This Bud's for you. By IBM, are you ready for e-business? By Gillette Mach 3, the first triple blade razor. And by the people of Allstate, you're in good hands with Allstate. We welcome you back to Yankee Stadium, all told, probably the sports world's most ancient and storied rivalry the Boston Red Sox, the New York Yankees, hooking up in the postseason for the first time. A look at Orlando Hernandez, and now a look at the Budweiser starting lineup for the Boston Red Sox. They lead it off with Jose Offerman at second base. John Ballantin, who had a seven RBI game in the division series, batting second. Brian Dombach is hitting third, the DH. Then it's Nomar Garcia Parra, the shortstop. Trey O'Leary, seven RBIs in game five in left field. Mike Stanley, a former Yankee at first. Jason Baratek catching. Darren Lewis is in center field, and Trot Nixon, a rookie, bats ninth in right field. And defensively for the New York Yankees, Shane Spencer getting the start in left field. Was added to the roster for the ALCS, replaces Jim Leyritz, the king on the postseason roster. Bernie Williams in center field, Paul O'Neill with the aching rib in right. Brocious Jeter, Knobloch, Martinez across the infield. Jorge Posada will catch El Duque, Orlando Hernandez. El Duque with that high leg kick from the windup. He does not use it from the stretch and comes at hitters in various arm angles. Right handers hit 187 against Hernandez this year. Left handers about 90 points higher. The scouting report will follow this little resume of El Duque. 17 and 9 on the year. ERA a little over four. For his career since last June 3rd, 29 and 13, and going to be the first pitcher since Mike Moore to win his first four postseason games. That high leg kick from a windup hides the ball very, very well. Four seamers, that's a sailing high rider into left handers, a curveball. He's really a fly ball pitcher, but that last point right there any pitch, any arm angle, any count. So Orlando Hernandez getting ready to take on these Boston Red Sox who in their final three games of that division series scored a total of 44 runs a postseason record their offense is red hot they had a day off yesterday and here we go this evening the Yankees and the Red Sox underway with a strike this broadcast also available in Spanish by utilizing the SAP button on your television. A word of warning, do not try this at home. <laughs> <laughs> Even raises up on that right toe as he lifts that left leg way up above his chest. Already a discussion at the plate as the home plate umpire Tim McClellan comes out from behind the catcher Posada, talks to Jose Offerman, and now Jimmy Williams is out to try to figure out what the two are talking about. I think what may have happened was that Offerman called time out to step out of the box, but Orlando Hernandez was already in his windup ready to deliver it. And McClellan just saying, uh, make sure you call time out a little earlier next time. So the first pitch is strike, and now the second of the night from the right hander. One ball, one strike. Talked about trying to win his first four postseason games for Hernandez. A total of 22 innings pitched in the postseason. He's allowed only 11 hits and one run. In the last two postseasons, this year and last, as that gets out of play in the count one and two on Offerman. And already out to talk to Hernandez is Posada. A lot of talking going on here early. Hernandez, who won game one of the division series with eight shutout innings against the Rangers. Only two hits allowed. 
And then that terrific game four start last year in Cleveland in the ALCS. Two balls, two strikes on Offerman. Ballantin will follow, then Daubach. Offerman lines one into center and a base hit to start the night for the Red Sox. Well, the offense already off to a good start for the Boston Red Sox. I guess something's got to give. As you look at the Red Sox hitting against the Indians, 47 runs total. A 318 team average, 10 home runs, 28 extra base hits. And the Yankees pitching against the Rangers as it was last year in the division series, absolutely dominating. Here's Valentin. John, 7 out of 22 in that division series against Cleveland. A check on Offerman, who has not stolen a base yet in the postseason, stole 18 during the regular season. Crowd awful quiet here at the start. As the first pitch brought into Valentin, ground ball left side, Cheater throws it into right field. Offerman will head to third, might score. They'll bring him to the plate. He'll score without a play, and over to third is Valentin. It's one to nothing, Boston, here in the first inning. Cheater, a terrific play to get to that ball. We've seen him make that play numerous times, but as he leapt and threw, he threw it wild, and the Red Sox have a first inning lead. Sometimes the second baseman on a play like that has to become a first baseman with the stretch. It looked to me like Knobloch was locked and couldn't cross over. The ball thrown to his right. Had both feet been on the bag, he'd have been a lot more flexible and going to his right. But that crossover step, and Knobloch couldn't at least block the ball. And a nice job of running by Jose Offerman to immediately recognize the bad throw, hit the bag at second, round third, and come right on in home, waved home by third base coach Wendell Kim. And now it's Valentin at third with nobody out. There's a fly ball into right for a base hit off the bat of Dombach, and the Red Sox have not slowed down since the division series. First three hitters have reached. It's 2-0 Boston here in the first inning, and still nobody out. Just to give you the scoring on the ball hit by Valentin, it's a fielder's choice, E6. Valentin now scores on the RBI hit by Daubach. Daubach got jammed a little bit on this fastball inside part of the plate, hit it down around the trademark. You saw him come off the bat with that top hand, try to drag it through with the bottom hand. Was able to dunk it out there in front of Paul O'Neill. Pedro Martinez in his reaction over on the dugout bench already having fun. And why not? The Red Sox jump out in front, now have their best hitter at the plate, Garcia Parra. And Cleveland Indians fans are all watching this telecast saying, don't intentionally walk him. <laughs> on deck is O'Leary, who did end the Indians during the division series, at least in game five. Garcia Parra out in front, one ball, one strike. After two intentional walks to Nomar Garcia Parra, on two pitches, a grand slam home run by Troy O'Leary. The next time up, a three-run homer. And in Garcia Parra's next at bat, they chose to pitch to him, and he doubled off the wall in left field. So, And, and then walked O'Leary intentionally. The 1-1 one, one pitch, Garcia Parra. Little off balance, pops it into left field. Spencer back to get it, and that is the first out here in the first inning. Runner at first with one out. The batter will be O'Leary. Two big swings of the bat in that game five. We just talked about the grand slam, the three-run home run, 28 home runs during the regular season. You can see the average not great. He was only four out of 20 in that division series, but he made two big swings count. One on, one out. And O'Leary takes ball one. Orlando Hernandez has already given up more runs in this first inning than he had in 22 previous innings pitched during the postseason. The 1 0 to Troy O'Leary. Two balls, no strikes. Last year, the Yankees winning 114 games. They won 11 of 13 in the postseason for 125 wins. And you might say, how can any game be a big game? 
Game four of the ALCS was the biggest game of the year for the Yankees, and it was won by El Duque against the Cleveland Indians. Three balls, no strikes now on O'Leary. Runner at first is Daubach, only one out here in the first inning. And that misses for ball four to put two on. So it's two on with only one out. Two runs already home, and here is ball four that missed the outside corner to Troy O'Leary. So a stunning beginning here in the first inning, at least to these Yankee fans who pack in here and usually are as loud as any group we come across. We were just in Cleveland at Jacobs Field on Monday night for that game five. They were just shaking Jacobs Field with the noise they were making here tonight, at least at the start. Eerily quiet, two on, one out. Time called at the plate. Mike Stanley is the hitter. He wore the Yankee pinstripes from 92 to 95 and again in 97. And Hernandez doesn't appear too comfortable here in the first inning as he steps off again. Yeah, trying to change the rhythm of the ball game. The Red Sox hitters are almost running up to the batter's box right now, the way they've been swinging the bats in this postseason. Two on, one out. Stanley pops it into right. O'Neill back at the track, at the wall to make the catch. The runners tag only one advances. That's Dahlbach to third, and it's first and third, two down. Usually, when a pitcher tries to change the pace of a ball game, he speeds it up. Hernandez elected to slow it down. That did not slow down Mike Stanley. A good low ball hitter who can flat hit the ball the other way and out of this ballpark here at Yankee Stadium. Only 314 down the line. 345 into the position and 385 to, to right center field. So a real left-handed hitter or right-handed hitter with power the other way is dream. So runners at the corners, two out. And the batter is the switch hitting catcher, Jason Veritek. Little pop up should end along top of the first. Not blocked. And it over. But not before damage is done by the Red Sox. Showing no signs of slowing down against El Duque. Get a couple and lead by two after a half. The 31 year old left hander, Ken Merker from Dublin, Ohio, getting ready to take on the Yankees for the first time ever here at Yankee Stadium. We look at the Budweiser starting lineup for the world champion Yankees. They lead it off with Chuck Knobloch at second base. Derek Jeter is batting second and short with Paul O'Neill hitting third in right field. Bernie Williams cleans up at a great division series of former LCS MVP. Shelly Davis is the DH. They move him up in the batting order with Tino Martinez batting behind Davis at first. Jorge Posada catches Shane Spencer in left and Scott Brocious is at third base batting ninth. And backing up Ken Merker, Troy O'Leary in left, Darren Lewis in center field, Trot Nixon the right fielder, Ballantin and Garciaparo. Garciaparo with 17 errors this year. But no one goes to the right and in any better with that whiplash throwing motion of Garciaparo. Offerman Stanley and Baratek behind the plate, perhaps the second best catcher behind Ivan Rodriguez in the American League. And they'll be squaring off the Yankees will against left-hander Kent Merker. You see his numbers in just under two months with the Red Sox. His career numbers as a starter, his career postseason numbers. As I mentioned, he started a fiasco game in Boston. You see the scouting report. He works inside on the right-handers. He doesn't really cut his fastball. It's a straight fastball, and he needs to spot it on both corners. His out pitch is still the changeup, a good straight changeup. We'll mix in a very effective three-quarter arm angle curveball. And we mentioned walks are a problem, and we know this Yankees offense, a very patient hitting club. And the first pitch is up for a ball to Chuck Knobloch. Mentioned the fiasco game. That would be the 23-7 game four. Yes, good guess. Yeah. Made the start, couldn't go two innings, but his teammates picked him up. Eventually the pitching was good enough, and it set up game five, which the Red Sox won 12-8. Knobloch takes ball two. Don't look for Knobloch to swing until he gets one strike. Yankees would like to get their home crowd right back into the game. Two-run first inning for the Red Sox is quieted. 
this usually boisterous crowd in the Bronx. There's a strike and it's two and one. Now block, then Jeter, then O'Neill in the first inning for the Yankees. Two and oh to two and two. Knobloch set a career high with 18 home runs during the regular season. Had only two hits in the division series. They didn't need much offense to advance to take on the Red Sox. Joe Torre's pitching staff allowed only one run to the Texas Rangers. The 2-2. Do it again. When Chuck Knobloch hits the ball hard on the ground, the line drives, of course, he's hitting well. The one problem that he had for about a six week period this year was dropping that back shoulder and hitting lazy fly balls to right field. Chris Chambliss, the hitting instructor of the Yankees, continually trying to remind Knobloch to stay on top of the ball when he swings. There's Chris. The 2 2 is popped up. With that back shoulder dipped down as Veritek goes back, gives it a look, struggles, and can't make the catch. A pop-up should have been handled. A lot of wind here at Yankee Stadium at the moment. And Knobloch gets a second life here in the first inning. You know, the wind pushed that ball back away from the stands. You see Veritek backpedaling, gets a glove on it. And once you start that backpedal motion, you're going to have a hard time getting the good part of the glove on that ball. And it hits down in the heel of the glove and pops out of Jason Veritek's mitt. Ground caused the fumble, and Veritek <laughs> commits the error. <laughs> it is an error. It's another 2-2 pitch, and Knobloch fouls this one back and out of play. Is he doing the old dip and rip? Yep, he surely is. The dip and rip, that uh, dip in that uh, back shoulder. He's done it his last three swings, making contact. You can see it right there. Now watch on contact where the back shoulder is. Pretty level on that one. But when you hit that ball up, that is, a, that is a bad sign. Those lazy fly balls the other way and right side of the infield. Another 2-2 pitch to Knobloch is popped down the left field line. Trouble of its fair into the corner. It is foul. A foul ball by six, seven, eight feet. And Knobloch, instead of a leadoff home run for the Yankees, We'll see yet another 2-2 pitch. That was a different type of dip and rip then. <laughs> well, that lift in his swing may be a byproduct of playing in the Homer Dome up in Minnesota for seven years, where you can lift the ball in the air and get some cheap home runs. But Knobloch, a much more valuable player to his offense, as you mentioned, when he's hitting the ball on the ground, hitting line drives. Ninth pitch of this at bat coming here. And again, it's a 2-2 delivery from Merker. A little ground ball and a changeup. Garcia Parra gets a tricky hop, one away. You remember the discussion between Jose Offerman and the home plate umpire. Let's find out what was going on. Steve Lyons joins us. Guys, after the first pitch of the ball game, that was a strike to Jose Offerman. El Duque took a white handkerchief out of his back pocket and wiped his mouth off. Offerman was questioning the legality of that, and then El Duque took it back out of his pocket and shook it at him a few times as if to taunt him. Then he gave up the line drive up the middle and consequently gave up two more runs in the inning. Back to you guys. All right, Steve. One thing it wasn't was a flag of truce. <laughs> what do we have? We have two analysts, one play-by-play -play guy, and not one of the three of us saw that. That's I didn't sad. see it. I didn't. I didn't. See it it's just good hygiene using a handkerchief out there. Most guys use their sleeve. <laughs> Here's a pitch inside for a ball to Jeter. The number two hitter for the Yankees, and what a year he had. That is not the handkerchief draped around the shoulders of El Duque. That's the towel version. As he watches with one out, nobody on, Jeter pop it foul. Already a better start to this one for Merker. It seems like... A nothing statement, but here in the first inning to battle Knobloch and throw nine pitches and eventually get him on a ground ball and a changeup. There's a minor victory for Merker here to start his night. Dave Winfield, former colleague and obviously a longtime Yankee. Joining us here at Yankee Stadium as Jeter is jammed in the count one and two. First breaking ball that Merker has thrown. That's that slider in on the fist of Derek Jeter. Derek fouling it off his left foot. 
That's a pitch that Merka really needs to set up well, working in and out with the fastball, then to come back with the breaking ball, put it in a good location. Jeter could only foul it off his leg. Talked to Merker yesterday. I said, do you get nervous before a start like this? He said, what's to get nervous about? If I stink, I stink. If I'm good, great. I'm a hero. Here's a foul back and out of play, and the count's still one and two. It's almost the team attitude of the Red Sox. They're playing with the house's money. That's what Jimmy Williams told us before the ball game today. You can't be afraid to fail. Go out there and play the game the way you have all year. Have a little fun, and don't be afraid to make mistakes. One out, nobody on. One ball, two strikes on Jeter. And that misses inside, two and two. Paul O'Neill on deck. Merker made his name with the Atlanta Braves, was always the fifth guy in that rotation when they had Avery and Smoltz and Glavin and eventually Maddox. Now a full count on Jeter. Joe Kerrigan, the pitching coach for the Red Sox, watching as Marker lost the edge with his hitter. It was one and two, now it's three and two. And a one on one. Yesterday, sitting down with Marker, we talked to him and got his feelings on tape, his thoughts of starting game one. I'm looking forward to it, you know. I think I need to bring my slingshot and a pebble out there with me. I'll beat David and try to slay Goliath. <laughs> Biblical reference, and uh, in a way, that's how Merker is looking at this start. Nothing wrong with a guy going out there and trying to beat the odds and beat a team that's supposed to beat up on him. One ball, one on, one out, and the first pitch coming to Paul O'Neill with Bernie Williams to follow. And a strike from Merker. Now Merker in his time with the Red Sox, 12 stolen bases attempted against him. Only three were successful. He has that ability to freeze the runner over there at first base. A slight hesitation at the top of his leg lift. And there's a look at Jeter, just what you talk about, and Derek read it easily. There was a decision to be made by the Yankees with regard to Paul O'Neill whether he would be physically able to play in this series. The broken right rib he's jammed and he fouls it out of play left side. We go back to Saturday October 2nd St. Petersburg Florida against the Tampa Bay Devil Rays in this effort. The Yankees already well out in front of the American League East. October 2nd the division was already wrapped up. And yet this effort, which is exactly why he is as valuable in the clubhouse as a leader as he is on the field for the Yankees. As a precautionary measure, Shane Spencer added to the roster for Joe Torre. Both are in the starting lineup here tonight. One ball, two strikes on Paul O'Neill. I think Ken Merker would be better served in going to the weakness of Paul O'Neill right now. When you have a broken rib, uh, you're not as apt to have as quick a bat. And pitching him inside instead of outside, in my opinion, would be the best way to work Paul until, until you see him swing a couple of times. To the right side, Offerman knocks it down, flips it wide, and safe is O'Neal. Breaking ball and a base hit, but a play that Offerman could clearly make. The ball hit the heel of the glove, and from the seat of his pants, he made the throw. He really had more time than he thought he had. He had plenty of time to at least get into a more balanced position to make the throw. You see the ball hit off the heel of the glove. Fortunately for Offerman, it stays right there. At this point, he had enough time to make a better balanced throw onto Mike Stanley. You can see Paul O'Neill just now coming into your picture. So Jose Offerman, who made 
An error in game two of the division series against the Indians, which led to a big inning. It's ruled a base hit, but clearly could have made a better throw, had much more time than he thought. We go back to game two and look like Sandy Alomar Jr. had grounded into a routine double play until that throw. And the Indians went on to an 11 to 1 victory at home over the Red Sox. Now it's two on with one out for Bernie Williams. And a comebacker to Merker. Thought about going to third, but ends up throwing to first for the second out of the inning. Joe, I think he thought about going to third and then second and finally went to first. He did have a play on Paul O'Neill. Paul hit the deck early at second base and never reached second base when he slid. Merker with one out, trying to make sure of one. Watch him look at third, now second, now first. But Paul O'Neill, meanwhile, was sliding and was four feet from second base when Kent elected to go to first. And I think because he checked third base first, and being a left-handed pitcher, his back was turned to the runner going from first to second. He right. never really did see how close or how far O'Neill was from the bag at second. And now Chili Davis with a base hit could tie this game. It's 2-0 Red Sox in the first inning. Runners on at second and third, two out. And a strike over the outside corner. As Merker looks at, uh, look at, looked at third, then second, Paul O'Neill hits the deck. He thinks he's out. And now the last step. <laughs> I can't feel too good with a broken rib no, either to hit uh -uh. the ground as hard as Paul O'Neill did right there. Chili Davis could tie it with a hit. One ball, one strike. Thousand three hundred seventy two career RBIs for Chili Davis who was playing in his fourth league championship series Marker with a 1 1 pitch had him off balance with a changeup and now Chili Davis in the hole one and two that changeup for Merker, not nearly as effective from the stretch. You know, Martinez on deck. You don't have uh, the lower part of the body deceiving the hitter like you do from the windup. And that's part of the problem Merker had in his start in the division series. He was really slowing his motion down on the changeup. The Cleveland hitters could see it coming, even though many times it wasn't in the strike zone. They were ready to hit off speed pitches. Change up and a line drive. No more Garcia Parra just saved two runs. Garcia Parra at the top of his leap. What an athlete. What a catch. He just saved two runs. Two nothing Boston after one. The 1999 American League Championship Series on Fox is brought to you by Chevrolet Trucks, the most dependable, longest lasting trucks on the road. Well, the Red Sox get a terrific play from Nomar Garcia Parra to end the first inning. At the top of his leap, a poor defensive play, or at least throw from Offerman started trouble, but a terrific defensive play ends trouble, and it's 2-0 Boston after one. Here in game one, as Darren Lewis takes a strike. Lewis has had a nice postseason. Six out of 16 against the Indians with two RBI. One ball, one strike from Hernandez. Ed Lewis very much an opposite field hitter. Knobloch cheating over a little bit toward the hole between first and second. Bernie Williams in center shaded a couple of steps over into the gap in right center. That's strike two. Take a look at the defense for the Yankees. Play him accordingly. And he's a guy that you watched with the San Francisco Giants. Guy who's played with the Cincinnati Reds, and he, by the way, is the only player in the Red Sox lineup tonight that has any experience in LCS play. He has a grand total of one at bat. One ball, two strikes from Hernandez. Trot Nixon will follow, and then back to Offerman. Two and two.
Take a look at David Cohn, who did not pitch in the division series. He was scheduled to pitch game four. There was no game four, so he will work in game two of this LCS tomorrow night. And now it's a full count on Darren Lewis leading off. David Cohn will hook up with Pedro's older brother. He's relegated to that title for the rest of his life. <laughs> Ramon Martinez. He will pitch game two for Boston. Three balls, two strikes. And Lewis takes a leadoff walk. He had Lewis set up. He loses Darren Lewis, and that's the second walk handed out by Hernandez. Where he lost Darren Lewis in that sequence wasn't the 3 2 fastball, it was the 2 2 breaking ball. Lewis has a very difficult time on that inside fastball, and just to throw two breaking balls in a row, 1 2 and 2 2, then you make him be perfect on the 3 2 pitch. Darren Lewis, more than any other Red Sox, is a guy you have to challenge with the fastball. So Lewis on to start the inning, and the batter is Nixon. And he takes a ball low. A lot of things Jimmy Williams can do right now. Wendell Kim, the third base coach, looking in the dugout. The Sox up by two. You're more inclined to take chances when you're up. Good hit and run situation here. And one of the better Red Sox base runners on first base in Darren Lewis. And so a check on Lewis over at first. Aaron Lewis at 62% during the regular season, 16 out of 26. Red Sox up by a couple here in the second inning. Orlando Hernandez is really fishing from, for some sort of rhythm here at the start. You're right, Joe. He's too tentative. He's slowing it down too much. A lot of times catchers can solve that problem by flashing the signs down a little quicker. Two balls, no strikes on Nixon after a leadoff walk. And Nixon was ready to unload, and he fouls it back two and one. If that's a catcher, you put down a tentative sign, you're going to get a tentative pitch. Of course, there's a natural delay before giving the sign. Posada will look over to the Yankees bench to get a sign from over there, whether they want El Duque to throw to first. Perhaps a pitch out, perhaps a step off. Two balls, one strike, and a look. And Lewis, Jorge Posada, who works with Orlando Hernandez, start after start after start. So if there's anybody who knows Hernandez on this Yankee team, it's Jorge Posada. Fastball inside right here. Runner goes. Swing and a miss at the plate, and down to second is Lewis. Stolen base for Darren Lewis, and that's his second of this postseason. Don't know whether that was the hit and run or the straight steal. Darren Lewis choosing the right pitch on which to steal. That inside fastball, the catcher's blocked out of that play. And Trot Nixon's check swing adds to the difficulty in making a throw. So now these two try to figure out a way to get a 2-2 pitch past Trot Nixon. Runner at second, nobody out. Into shallow right center field, a long run, and it bounces in front of Williams. They will hold Lewis at third, and it's first and third with nobody out. Talked about the working relationship between Jorge Posada and Orlando Hernandez. Here are his thoughts on catching the Cuban-born right-hander. You know, five starters is the toughest to uh, figure out if he's going to be, you know, on that night because uh, uh, he's always the same. He goes to the bullpen. He's always the same. He's always early. You know, he's always ready to, you know, get his work down down there in the bullpen. And uh, you know, you catch him in the bullpen, and he's always the same. Well, these two trying to figure it out here in the early innings, and already the Red Sox lead by a couple, have two on with nobody out. And have the top of the order up, Jose Offerman. Singled his first time, later scored, and he takes ball one. If you're the runner at third base with nobody out and the runner on at first, the one thing that you try to keep in mind, you do not want this a situation after a ground ball to be first and second and one out. So what you have to do is determine the speed of the ground ball that's hit. If it's a chopper toward third, 
The only play for a guy like Brocious, for instance, will be one out. So you have to stay there. If it's a hard hit ball, then Brocious or Jeter or Knobloch will try to go for two. It's almost like a car pulling out to a stop sign and determining the speed of the car coming towards you as to whether you go or not. Well, as we approach 9 o'clock here in the East in the Bronx at Yankee Stadium, it's game one of this ALCS. Joe Buck, Tim McCarver, Bob Brenly with you. And the Red Sox, who had scored 21 runs in their last 44 innings coming in to this game one, got two in the first inning, and they have two more on with nobody out here in the second. They're trying to go to an inning, trying to add to their game one lead. Runners at the corners with nobody out, and Offerman ahead on the count, one ball, no strikes. One and one. So much said about this series between the Red Sox and the Yankees coming in. The Red Sox, who with runners in scoring position, are hitting 469 during this postseason, asking for a hit from Offerman. Reaching for it to the plate comes Lewis and it's a base hit an infield hit they throw behind Nixon safe and it's three nothing Boston in the second inning. Just a little clunker to the left side and after it got past Brocious Jeter had no play. Well Jeter was actually decoyed by Brocious. He thought Scott was going to continue to come cut the ball off and make the play and there's a change of direction on Jeter. He had to go back to his right watch. Yeah, Jeter had started to move toward third base since Brocious had evacuated that position. Jeter was on his way over to cover third base when Brocious let the ball go. You'll watch Jeter change directions. He'll start in on the ball when he sees Brocious start to make the play. He hits for third and then has to retrace his steps to make the play, and they cannot get it out. And now it's first and second with nobody out, and the hitter is Valentin who reaches for it and pops it up. Waiting for it, Bernie Williams, and that is a big out for the Yankees here in the second. So two on, one out, the number three hitter, Brian Daubach, has a chance. He singled home a run in the first inning. We started to talk about this series and what we will lay out for you during this ALCS between Boston and New York. And the rivalry and the history between these two clubs. A rich history of the Boston Red Sox, rich history of the New York Yankees, and they are intertwined throughout this century. Don Zimmer, who's now the right hand man for Joe Torre, was the manager of the Red Sox with that collapse in 1978. Boston Massacre, and eventually the home run by Bucky Dent in the one game playoff. Two on, one out. And Dombach fouls it away, strike one. Garcia Parra waits on deck. Red Sox being very aggressive early in the count. First pitch, if that ball is near the strike zone, whether it's a fastball, a breaking ball, a changeup, Red Sox hitters are just looking for anything in the strike zone on that first pitch, and they're letting the bats go. Daubach, a 27-year-old rookie. Fouls another strike, too. Brian would love to have that one back. He just missed that fastball. Red Sox could not be in a better position. They have two on, one out, and the hitters that hit Hernandez the best, Daubach and Garciaparra this year, have a chance to, to whack. Dahlbach, who struggled during the month of September, did hit 21 home runs during the regular season. He's one of the Red Sox fans' favorite, Jim Rice, watching. As this crowd finally makes some noise. No balls, two strikes, two on, one out. One and two. Bob, you were talking about it between innings. You said the crowd here was shocked, just like uh, the Yankee players. I absolutely think so. They were up very much before the ball game, but after that first inning when the Red Sox put that two spot on the board, it got very quiet. Quiet here, loud in New England. 
There's a one guy making noise in this park. One ball, two strikes. And Daubach fouls another. You have the buildup, the anticipation for a series. Now it's finally here. The visiting team comes out and scores two runs. An error mixed in in the first inning. You have this pitching matchup of El Duque, Orlando Hernandez, against Kent Merker, a guy who couldn't go two innings in his start on Sunday night. You think blowout. Right now it's 3 0 Red Sox as Daubach pops it up. Third base side for Brocious. Two gone. See Daubach hitting at the top of his helmet with the bat. That's the one thing Hernandez has to do is come inside the left-handed batters and try to prevent them from leaning out over the plate. He crowded Daubach with that neck-high fastball to get him out. And now Garcia Parra, who made that leaping catch to end the first inning. The tying runs in scoring position moments ago. Now he bats with runners at first and second, two out. American League batting champion waits and pops it up into left field. Pretty well hit, but Spencer back near the track. And it's only a one run second inning for the Red Sox. Put their first three on, get only one lead, two, and after an inning and a half, two nothing Boston. Three nothing Boston, rather. Well, Ken Merker back to the hill. His teammates got him two in the first, one in the second. That adds up to three. It's three nothing Boston. Tino Martinez, Jorge Posada, and Shane Spencer. Six, seven, and eight hitters will bat for the Yankees. So they slip Martinez down a spot. He's a guy who has struggled in the ALCS. And he takes a strike from Merker, hitting only 143 in 17 games coming in for Tino Martinez in his history during the league championship series. 17 strikeouts. One and one from Merker. Rather tame atmosphere, and I know we've talked about it a couple of times already, but for Kent Merker, it is very different from what he expected coming into this game. Martinez pops it into right. Waiting for it is Nixon. Tino just did get under it, and Nixon makes the catch one away. We go to the thoughts of Kent Merker about coming in and pitching here at Yankee Stadium. It's going to be loud, you know, and I know they're going to be on me, but uh, you know what, as a player, I mean, it's, it's, it motivates you. If you don't let it get to you, you can use it, you know, to your advantage. And uh, like I said, I've never had to face that out here, but we'll find out tonight. Well, he's finding out, and by his teammates getting him a couple of runs early, has at least at the moment taken the crowd out of it. Posada with one out, nobody on. Batting, switch hitting catcher, takes the ball. I'll tell you, if I was a starting pitcher, I'd rather have my motivation from three runs in the first two innings than a loud crowd. <laughs> the marker got the three, and he's pitched rather well with the lead. He did walk Jeter in the first inning. Allowed a hit by O'Neill. This is here with a changeup, and he's 2-0 on Posada. Merker, even though he has a three-run lead, continues to pitch like it's a tie ball game. Good sign, especially early. Chopper to short, high hop for Garcia Park. Two up, two down here in the second inning for the Yankees. I think unless you see Garcia Parra on a day-by-day -day basis, there's not much made about his arm strength. But I don't see many shortstops that get the ball to first any harder or any quicker than Nomar Garcia Parra. Garcia Parra might be the fastest pitcher that Mike Stanley's ever caught <laughs> from shortstop. And, and keep in mind, he's doing it with a bum right wrist. He was plumped on that wrist back on September 25th by Al Reyes of the Baltimore Orioles. Had to miss a game in the division series because of that right wrist showing no ill effects on the throws across the infield here tonight. The right wrist taped as Spencer takes low for ball one. 
Shane Spencer who became an instant hero down the stretch last year and then carry that on with two home runs in the division series against the Rangers in 1998. He's not active for this past division series and he is activated and tonight in the lineup. A broken right rib part of Paul O'Neill forced Joe Torre to buy a little insurance by putting Spencer on the list. It's a foul to and one. That is a dangerous pitch to an inside hitter when you're behind in the count. You can see Jason Veritek setting up inside. Shane Spencer is an inside hitter. Some guys like the ball down, others like it up. But Shane Spencer likes it inside, up or down. Two out with the bases empty, and the 2 1 pitch is grounded to third foul. Well, Shane Spencer and the man who was retired right before him, Jorge Posada, the two Yankees in the lineup tonight who hit better against left-handed pitching than they do right-handed pitching. Some of the numbers are very comparable, as you might imagine, for Derek Jeter, but Spencer and Posada, two guys that wear out left-handed pitching. So Merker looking for a perfect second inning. He's two and two on Spencer. And with a changeup, had him out in front. Spencer just did get a piece. Parker trying to do what he couldn't do. He made that game four start in Boston for the Red Sox, and that is complete two innings. One strike away from doing just that. Spencer pops it down the right field line, slicing into the corner and foul. So Shane Spencer is active, ready to go, and in the lineup tonight, Jim Leyritz is not available to Joe Torre. They had to deactivate Leyritz. Joe Torre didn't enjoy going to tell Jim Leyritz that he wasn't going to be active for this series. That could change if the Yankees move on and play in the next round. That's off the end of the bat into left center field and down for a hit. Spencer is on with two out here in the second. Pretty good piece of hitting with two strikes. The good hitters protect the outside part of the plate. And when you do that, good things happen. That is a good pitch by Merker. Better hitting by Spencer. And you can see how he bent over at the waist, extending his upper body out over the plate so he could reach that change up that was down and away from him, get enough of the bat on it to hook it back into left center. Brocious now. The number nine hitter who drove home 71 runs during the regular season. Takes the ball high. The 1998 postseason. Big numbers for Brocious, who hit down at the bottom of the order and was the World Series MVP. Two balls, no strikes from Merker. Just like Spencer, when you're behind in the count, stay away. You can come in inside on him with two strikes, but not with the count, two balls and no strikes. Staying away and hitting the corner with a 90 mile per hour fastball to make it two and one. Now block waits on deck. High change up and Brocious fouled it. Two balls, two strikes. Had that shot of Jimmy Williams. We go in and talk to the managers before the game. You could talk to Joe Torrey for an hour. You can talk to Jimmy Williams for an hour, but he's not going to tell you much about what he's thinking going into an LCS. You're going to do all the talking. <laughs> yeah, but Jimmy, what, what happens if Merker pitches well for the first two? Eight? We're just playing tonight. Merker's starting. That's it. We're going to go play. We're going to go play baseball. About all you get. Two balls, two strikes, one on, two out. Now a full count. Yeah, and, and it's not that Jimmy's being arrogant or smart or anything like that. He's just a 
He's just that is his mindset. One pitch, one inning, one hitter, one game. He lives in baseball cliches. But it's an honest reaction from Absolutely. A guy who should win manager of the year in the American League this year. Runner goes on a 3-2 pitch and Brocious hits it to deep left field. Back is O'Leary at the wall. Goodbye. Brocious a two-run home run. And it's a 3-2 Boston lead. stretch he doesn't have the lower body leg kick and power to deceive the hitter that changeup stayed up true to its word and Brocious turned to catcher Jason Baratek and said Jason I'll handle this one and true to form Yankee Stadium lights up a two strike changeup in my mind is always an easier pitch for a hitter to hit Granted, Kent Merker's out pitch is that changeup, but the hitter's already in a defensive mode. He's trying to protect the plate. That off-speed pitch allows him more time to see the ball, make an adjustment, and still hit it hard. One ball, one strike on Knobloch, who grounded out his first time up. Well, basically, it gets back to location. That changeup down around the knees or a little bit lower, you probably get a ground ball on the left side. A changeup where Merker threw it, Two run home run. Not only was it not down, but too much of the plate. A fat changeup. And here it is one more time. The motion of Merker from the stretch position. There's not a lot of activity with the lower body, so where's the deception? Roach just not fooled either. Two balls and a strike on Knobloch. And that's pretty well hit to left field. O'Leary back the wall to make the catch and end the inning. Merker threw two innings. But the 10th man just woke up. A wake-up call sent out here in the Bronx thanks to Scott Brocious. A two-run shot. It's a one-run Red Sox lead. Well, Ken Merker trying to get through two innings. Gave up the hit to Spencer on a pretty good pitch down and away. The changeup to Brocious was not a good pitch, and Scott drove it over the wall and left. It's a one-run Boston lead. Third inning rolls in, and so does Troy O'Leary, who takes ball one. And now ball two. Hernandez to me doesn't look like he's got much jump on the ball tonight. As he brings it in, called a high strike, 91 miles per hour, two balls and a strike. Much too deliberate, much too tentative thus far. Big rip by O'Leary, two and two. That's the best fastball he's thrown all night. Had late pop to it. And that was the shortest amount of time between pitches as Jorge Posada gets his wake up call for the evening. Right in the nose. You miss that, don't you? Woo. I do. <laughs> Not even a little bit. <laughs> two balls, two strikes. O'Leary leading off. Stanley and Baratek will follow. Third inning. And now a full count on Troy O'Leary. Top to bottom, this Red Sox lineup was devastating. The final three games against the Indians didn't seem to matter who was at the plate. O'Leary swing and a miss. Goodbye. And that's the first strikeout for Hernandez. Mike Stanley flying to Paul O'Neill earlier. He had three of his ten hits during the division series were to right field. But you know he uses the other part of the field with which to hit but keep in mind this is Yankee Stadium not Fenway Park that's why he has 75 hits to left field and only 14 to right 360 into the position at Fenway Park to right field and of course the green monster in left so he's a different hitter in this ballpark and true to form he fly to right his first time up 
Got under the ball and flied to the track and right caught by O'Neill. Took a ball as Hernandez continues to fall behind hitters. Strike on a late breaking pitch from Hernandez. One ball, one strike. Not only late breaking, but a late call from home plate umpire Tim McClellan. See that slider just off of the outside corner. Posada with a nice job of holding it there. Stanley gets a base hit into left field. Mike Stanley is on. The Red Sox have a man at first with one out here in the third inning, and Jason Baratak walking in. You know, we talked about Jimmy Williams. You see this Boston team, they take on that mentality. I, I don't see a lot of guys that, that are worried about being here at Yankee Stadium, a lot of guys who don't enjoy being the underdog. I think Jimmy Williams loves the role of the underdog. There is no doubt that they were against the Indians, and they rolled through them the final three games, and they're out in front here in game one of the ALCS, and they have a man at first and only one out. Veritek now takes the ball low. Also, the Red Sox played exceptionally well against the Yankees during the season. Keith Olbermann telling us that uh, the Red Sox beat the Yankees 8 of 12 during the season, including a sweep about a month ago here at Yankee Stadium. Right in the middle of a long 12-game road trip for the Red Sox. As Veritek pops it foul into the seats. To the upper deck for... Strike one, one ball, one strike. On that road trip, they went to Seattle, Oakland, New York, and Cleveland, playing 12 games and going nine and three. And in my mind, and you talk to the Red Sox players in their minds, that's what put them into the postseason. One on, one out, one ball, one strike, and Veritek strike two. Going up uh, his pants is Nomar Garciaparo. He ought to try that on that shirt he wears under his regular shirt. One ball, two strikes, Veritek. That thing really needs it. <laughs> he can win a batting title, he can play great short, he can sew, <laughs> he can make Julian fries. Hey, Boy, get a shot on Mar Martha Stewart. <laughs> one of the most superstitious players in the game today. <laughs> I'm sure he's trying to save those pants at all costs. Two balls, two strikes, and now a full count. Well, whatever he's doing, he's really grinding on it there. Oh, he's fixing a necklace. That's what he was uh -huh. doing. I see. There we go. Did look like he was sewing up uh, the pants, uh, the left leg of his pants. Three balls, two strikes, one on, one out. Veritek off the end of the bat right side. It's trying to get out of play. Great effort and a catch by Tino Martinez. Two out. Some CEO of some Fortune 500 company just met Tino Martinez. Hey, we saw Jason Veritek earlier in the ball game chase a pop foul behind home plate. You see Veritek trying to wish it out of play. But you mentioned, Joe, a lot of wind here up above the stadium, and that ball appeared to come back close enough for Tino Martinez to make that leaping catch into the stands. Great catch by Martinez. We've seen another Boston catcher try to wave at a ball. This time it was Veritek, a catcher trying to Push it foul. About 1975, game six. Carlton Fisk trying to keep it fair. And he did. Somebody did. Only to lose game seven and add to the frustration for Red Sox fans. Darren Lewis at the plate. One on, two out. Red Sox lost the 46 World Series in seven games to St. Louis. Lost the 67 World Series in seven games to St. Louis. Lost the 75 World Series in seven games to Cincinnati. Of course, the 86 World Series in seven games to the Mets. The curse of the Bambino. We've gone 
almost two and a half innings without even mentioning that here in the booth as Jeter makes a leaping catch to take a hit away from Darren Lewis. Here it is, Carlton Fisk. A happy moment for Red Sox fans. It did stay fair. It was a home run. Frustration the next night. Welcome back with views from high above. Flies the Bud One airship. Made with the freshest all-natural ingredients for brewery fresh taste. Budweiser, the official beer of Major League Baseball and the American League Championship Series. We thank them for joining us here tonight. Derek Jeter made that leaping catch to end the top of the third inning. Leads off the bottom of the third inning with O'Neill and Williams to follow against Kent Merker. 3-2 Boston. And back to the play by Jeter. Well, we've seen each shortstop showcase their defensive skills. Garcia Parra perhaps got a little higher in the air. Jeter didn't have to get quite as high. Jeter into right center field. That ball is down on a hop all the way to the wall. Jeter will dig for second and hold with a leadoff double. And there's the tying run for the Yankees here in the third. Darren Lewis trying to take the best angle on this ball, tailing away from him, realizing that if he can't cut it off, if the ball gets by him, then it's hit hard enough to where he can recover and hold Jeter to a double. Derek Jeter's parents, Kalamazoo, Michigan, watching as Jeter plugs the gap in right center field. <laughs> it looked like his dad was saying triple, triple. <laughs> For a while it looked like it, but willing to hold with a double with nobody out. And now O'Neill. Bryce Flory, who was just added to the active roster for the Red Sox, along with Pat Rapp, another right-hander, as they dropped both Tim Wakefield and John Wasden from their pitching staff for this LCS. Flory getting ready. While Merker faces O'Neill. One ball, one strike. Again, remember the first at bat of Paul O'Neill. He broke a bat being jammed by Merker, and then he got his base hit on a hanging breaking ball away. Once again, with that broken rib, in my opinion, you got to bust Paul O'Neill inside until he proves that he can hit that pitch in his condition. Trying to at least advance the tying run, the 1 1 pitch. Again, staying away, and that's strike two. Cleanup hitter Bernie Williams, a switch hitter next. Merker probably staying away in this particular at bat, trying to get O'Neill to hit the ball to the left side of the field and keep Jeter at second base. Merker, no strikeouts tonight, would like one here. One ball, two strikes. Two and two. Paul O'Neill, who drove home 110 runs during the regular season. Been with his Yankees since 1993, and for the first time in a Yankee uniform, failed to hit 300. The 2 2 pitch. First strikeout of the night, and it comes at a perfect time for the Red Sox and Kent Merker. Bob, I think you're exactly right. I mean, five pitches away on a guy that should be pitched inside. First, the breaking ball misses. Fastball fouled away. Fastball fouled away. Fastball is low. And Paul O'Neill going out on a tight slider. So all five pitches away to Paul O'Neill. In a very awkward swing, you can see after he brought the bat through the strike zone and did not make contact, he tried to pull that right arm down close to the rib cage. It's obvious he's still bothered by that broken rib, and understandably so. Tying run at second, one out now, and ball one is high to Bernie Williams. 
Williams 202 hits during this season a career high. Very nearly became the Red Sox center fielder over this past offseason. Got a phone call to George Steinbrenner said make me a fair offer. And I'll come back. He did and he ended up third in the American League with an average of 342. Two balls no strikes from Merker with Chili Davis on deck. Lead off double by Jeter O'Neill struck out. And now Veritek wants to go out and make sure on the signs with Jeter the runner down at second. When you're talking about Ken Merker uh, you're talking about a, a pitcher that's had arm problems over the past couple of years part of that five man yet. Uh, Atlanta Brave staff who pitched a no hitter on April 8, 1994, against the Los Angeles Dodgers in Los Angeles. And while Barker makes the start here, Ramon Martinez watches. He'll be the starter in game two tomorrow night. Merker brings it on 2-0, and, oh, and Williams took ball three. If you're thinking about stolen base, now's the time to try to do it if you're Derek Jeter. The Yankees are trailing by one. You're on second base with one out. You don't do it with nobody out, or with two outs. But with one out, it's worth the risk. Williams grounds off the glove of Valentin. What a play. Throws behind Jeter and Wild. Jeter gets up, goes to third. No throw, and it's first and third, one out. Now each shortstop, Jeter and Garcia Parra, have shown incredible range and reach. But each have made throwing errors in the early innings of game one. We talked about a change of direction of Derek Jeter unsuccessfully on that ball hit by Offerman in the second inning. That's what Garcia Parra had to do after the ball is off the glove of Valentin. The interesting thing is nobody's covering third. Garcia Parra, change of direction. Jeter had gone toward third base. He saw Garcia Parra going that direction. And Garcia Parra threw behind Derek. And the ball eluding Offerman and going into right field. So Jeter goes to third, an error on Garcia Parra. Well, a tremendously athletic play just to be able to knock that ball down and keep it from going into left field. Jeter at second base, he, he's kind of in a rocking chair. He wants to go to third. He sees the ball get through, but then Garcia Parra made the fantastic play before throwing it away into right field, allowing Jeter to ultimately end up at third base. If Garcia Parra doesn't make that catch and the ball rolls to the outfield, Jeter scores. It's first and third with one out. It's a single E6 and Chili Davis lines to the second baseman Offerman. Two gone. Off the end of the bat looked like it was headed for center field but not well hit. And it's first and third two out now. So Merker is one out away from getting through three innings now and he's already up to 62 pitches on the night. Yeah, the key total is that one in the walk column. Merker's had very good command of his pitches in this ball game, keeping his fastball down low, going up the ladder with the fastball when he's wanted to. He's been hurt on some change-ups that have straight up and over the heart of the plate, but other than that, he seems to have pretty good command tonight. And now a lefty-lefty matchup as Merker will deal with Tino Martinez. Tino flied out to right his first time up. Tying run, Jeter is over at third. Go ahead run is Bernie Williams at first. Two out. And a line drive. No more again. Garcia Parra, another leaping catch to end an inning. He did it in the first. He does it here in the third. And the Yankees strand a couple. They have left four on the night. Still trailed by one after three. We welcome you.
me back to the fourth inning. It's still 3-2. The Red Sox out in front. Two shortstops in this game. Trading highlight plays and Aaron throws to the first three innings. Derek Jeter was the one standing on third when Omar Garcia Parra made that leaping catch. Garcia Parra saved two runs with a leaping catch back in the first inning. Saved at least one in the bottom of the third inning with that last play. And now Trot Nixon, the number nine hitter, will lead off. Boston up by a run. Fourth inning now, and Nixon took hey. a strike. Red Sox have had base runners in every inning as Nixon falls into an 0-2 hole. Talk about an odd lineup and a thunderous lineup at that. How many lineups feature the center fielder and right fielder batting eighth and ninth and the shortstop hitting fourth? Really is an odd configuration, especially for a team that plays their home games at Fenway Park, but they have their center fielder batting eighth, their right fielder hitting ninth. As you mentioned the shortstop, Garcia Parra cleaning up as Nixon takes ball two, two and two. You're used to seeing corner infielders or corner outfielders, in some instances a catcher hitting through the middle part of that lineup, the RBI slots. Nixon is gone, and that's strikeout number two for El Duque. We feature the two shortstops, and we give you the two plays made by Nomar Garcia Parra back in the first inning. This to save two runs. And then just moments ago to end the third. And once again, in an odd way, by making that error, Garcia Parra saved a run. Because if he doesn't get to that ball, the ball gets to the outfielder. Jeter scores. Offerman takes ball one. It looks like both offenses would be better served trying to hit the ball on the ground to the shortstop. Because you can't get it over their heads. <laughs> can't get it over them. Little check swing foul. One ball, one strike. Tough to get one around him or throw him. And when you look at a guy like Garcia Parra cleaning up, Jeter could pretty much hit anywhere in this right. Yankee lineup. He's, clean, he's cleaned up for the Yankees several times this year. Offerman pops it up. Long run in for Spencer. He's there. Two down. Take a guy like Alex Rodriguez in Seattle. A cleanup type hitter. And you really see a, a change in the shortstop position. Tim, I'm sure you never imagined when you were playing in the 60s and 70s that you would see a shortstop, a 40-40 shortstop like Alex Rodriguez is in Seattle. Here's that play, uh, the change of direction, Gar Garcia Parra making the play, so even though he threw low to second, Jeter went to third, he finished the inning with that fine play. But you're right, Joe, I mean, they have changed. Jeter, Garcia Parra, and Rodriguez, three stars in the American League that have changed the definition of that position. Batters Valentin, who is 0 for 2, did reach on a fielder's choice and the error by Jeter back in the first. He flied to center his next time. And this is into left center field. Well hit, Spencer over his head. Up against the wall, and Valentin with that bad left knee limps into second base with a two-out double. So base runners still in every inning for the Red Sox and an RBI opportunity for Daubach. Looked like Spencer took a very shallow line going after this line drive into the gap in left center. It's over there, ends up looking straight up over his head as that ball actually landed back to his left. You see Valentin as he limps around first base. It's going to take a very well-placed base hit or perhaps an extra base hit to get him home from second base. Gaubach, the man at the plate, drove home a run back in the first inning. One out of two on the night, and Hernandez steps off. The Yankee outfielders do not have good throwing arms. Spencer in left field, below average. Bernie Williams in center, below average. Paul O'Neill leads the outfielders in assists, has an excellent arm, but a broken rib on the right side. So he'll be a little more deliberate getting rid of him. Strike one on Dalbach. And the Red Sox third base coach, Wendell Kim, has always been very aggressive in his handling of base runners. 
And he certainly knows the strengths and weaknesses of the Yankee defenders, who's got the arms, who you can run on, and who you cannot. But with two outs, he figures to be very aggressive in sending Valentin if the opportunity arises. Strike two. So if you're Valentin at second base, you have to cheat somewhere. And the place that he has to cheat is off the second base, particularly with two strikes. Two strikes, two outs. He's off. When he sees the ball in the strike zone, he takes off. Red Sox trying to add to their lead as Dahlbach strikes out. Three strikeouts now for Hernandez. A two-out double wasted by the Red Sox. Boston still up by one. Back at Yankee Stadium, ready to play in the bottom of the fourth inning. It's a 3-2 Boston lead, and back to the hill is Kent Merker. Keep in mind that only four left-handed starters won here at Yankee Stadium this season. Chuck Finley and Jim Parquet. And then an in interleague action, Tom Glavin of the Braves and Al Leiter of the Mets. And if you remember that Sunday night game against the Mets, one by Al Leiter is what started the Mets on a terrific roll. June 6th, and from then on, it was the Mets either at the top of the National League Eastern Division or running away with a wild card until the final week and a half of the regular season. Talk about the Mets, and as they play in the NLCS, they're down two games to none, losing 4 3 to Atlanta. Game started by Millwood. Rocker pitched in the eighth. John Smoltz worked the ninth inning for the save. One ball, one strike, and Posada took strike two. Five times Cy Young Award winner Roger Clemens will be pitching in game three of this series against Pedro Martinez in a matchup that. So many are already talking about it. it'll take place on Saturday late afternoon at Fenway Park in the shadows Ooh. might be 35 strikeouts and no hits to the 11th inning. Well, the players are all hoping for some serious overcast on Saturday. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Excellent point. The 2 2 pitch is tapped back to Merker. And Posada is gone to start the fourth inning. We remind you to look for the Gillette $1 million strike zone challenge in game three of the American League Championship Series on Fox. Is it my juvenile mind that I can't say $1 million without thinking of Austin Powers or Dr. Evil? <laughs> Dr. Evil. Sad. Little finger to the lips. $1 million. One out, nobody on. <laughs> You bailed out at the end of that, it's didn't contagious. you? Yes, I did. You I did, did, didn't he? He got a little, sorry, a little nervous, a little, little shaky, little ALCS nerves, and he <laughs> bailed out on Doctor Evil. One out, nobody on, and Spencer pops it foul, backing out of play. Spencer singled and scored a run. He singled with two outs in the second inning, right in front of the Brocious two-run home run. delivery and that's out of play for strike two guys the last day game that we did in the American League Championship Series was two years ago in Cleveland when Mike Messina started and struck out 15 in seven innings against the Indians he was matched as far as runs were scored when Oral Hershiser shut out the Baltimore Orioles for seven innings so if they could strike out 15 What's Pedro and Roger Clemens going to do if the sun is shining, as you pointed out, Bob? Here's strikeout number two for Merker on the night as Spencer didn't like the call from Tim McClellan, the home plate umpire. Rung up, two up, two down, and Merker is still striving for his first perfect inning of the night. It looked like Spencer thought that ball was up and inside. Get a look from up top. Borderline at best. Best time to crowd a hitter is with two strikes, generally speaking. Scott Brocious now, who is responsible for the two runs on the board for the Yankees. One on, two out. Back in the second. The old hanging changeup. 
on a change up down low and away. Spencer hit it off the end of the bat. That change up caught way too much play. Fastball misses up. One ball, one strike. Kent Merker is working on two days rest. Pitch that Sunday night game in the division series. Really thought he felt too good when he was out there. Merker, who had been injured on September 6th in Seattle when he collided with Wilton Barris and foul territory down the third base side. He hurt his rib cage on the right side. Went on the 15-day disabled list. The ribs starting to feel better. That's trouble down the right field line of its fair. Diving try by Nixon. Can't get it. It rolls down toward the corner, and Brocious will at least be at third. Played by the second baseman, Offerman. Terrific hustle play by Offerman. And it's a two-out triple for Scott Brocious. Jose Offerman just saved a run. If he doesn't trail that play, the ball gets by Nixon, and Trot is thrown on the line up against the padding in right field. He doesn't even know where the ball is. So it took the alert play, Joe. You're right. By Offerman, you can see Nixon, who may have sprained that right wrist. He has no clue where the ball is. Offerman saving a, a run by trailing the play. And now Scott Brocious with the two biggest legs on the cycle, a home run and a triple. It's good just to see Nixon get back to his feet after sliding head first into that wall down the right field corner. So all of a sudden, the tying run is at third with two out for the Yankees and Chuck Knobloch, who is 0 for 2, stands in. 3 2 Boston. Ball one from Merker. Doing very little in this postseason. After a regular season in which he bounced back at least toward the form. The Yankees and the rest of baseball saw from Knobloch when he was with the Twins. Second year with the Yankees, he took a strike. One ball, one strike. Here's Jose Offerman taking nothing for granted, going out to right field, and now realizing that Nixon can't get to it. So he just keeps on running. And had he not done that, to reiterate, Brocious scores. Steady stops at third, and he watches as ball two is up to Knobloch, two and one. Jeter is next, so Knobloch ought to get something to hammer here with a two-ball, one-strike count. Brocious the tying run at third. Ball three, three and one. Well, Jimmy Williams has a right-hander loose and ready to go. I believe that's still Bryce Flory down there for the Red Sox. He began to throw when this inning started. If Knobloch gets on, I would not be a bit surprised to see Flory in the ball game. Play this game by increments. He is on with a two-out walk. Second walk handed out by Merker. And it's runners at the corners with two down. 80 pitches on the night for Merker, and that was his last of the evening. Number 80 is it, it would appear, as Jimmy Williams makes his way out of the dugout. Joe Kerrigan made an earlier visit. We'll wait and see if Williams does make the change. He's at least out there to talk. State his case to Merker. Merker, who was disappointed when he was yanked in the second inning on Sunday night. I'm sure hoping he gets a chance to face Jeter. The Boston Red Sox beat the Cleveland Indians three out of five, and not one starter won a game. Starters for the Red Sox 0-1 in that five-game series. They're going to leave Merker in. That's a tough decision right here. Because now if you if you pitch to Jeter, you're committed to pitch to O'Neill. Sometimes a manager just wants to hear the right things from that pitcher when he goes out there to the mound. And apparently Kent Merker said whatever Jimmy Williams wanted to hear. He's going to leave him in the ballgame to face Derek Jeter. 
Got O'Neill on deck, a left-handed batter. Bernie Williams, a switch hitter after O'Neill. And you've got the tying run at third, the go-ahead run at first with two down here in the fourth inning. And we'll see how this decision pays off for Jimmy Williams and the Red Sox. He leaves Merker in, and Merker finds the inside corner for strike one. Flory at this point might as well have a seat out of the bullpen. Flory has stopped throwing for the moment. As the 0-1 is brought home and Jeter took strike two over the inside corner, 0-2. Two inside fastballs to Derek Jeter. So if you're going to crowd him early, if you're Derek Jeter, you can look for that ball inside late in the count, too. Led the American League with opposite field hits and a notorious two-strike hitter. First and third, two down. One run lead for the Red Sox, and Jeter pops it foul. Back toward the Yankee dugout, and just out of the reach of Veritek. Remember, the wind is working in a manner which would bring that foul ball back toward the field of play. Veritek, who had one brought back behind him that he missed back in the first inning, was about a foot away from making an inning-ending catch at the top step of the Yankee dugout. Also interesting to note that Derek Jeter hit 84 points lower this year against left-handed pitching. Jimmy Williams certainly aware of that. Jeter could tie it with a hit. To the third baseman, Valentin. Goes the short way, and the inning is over. We go back to the play by Jose Offerman. About 300 feet away from home plate when he caught up to this ball that got past Tron Nixon. He saved a run at the moment. He saves a run in the inning and keeps the Boston Red Sox out in front by one. Well, the hustle on the part of Jose Offerman certainly wasn't lost on his teammates. Here's his reception when he got back to the dugout after the bottom of the fourth inning. Yeah, you would think that Jose Offerman made the inning-ending tremendous defensive play. In fact, he did make a tremendous defensive play that inning. Saved a run. The Red Sox lead by one. And that's the first out here in the fifth inning off the bat of Garcia Parra into the glove of Bernie Williams. We talked about Jimmy Williams not being afraid. The easy move last half inning would have been to bring in Bryce Flory. That's an easy move. It's not second guess. Merker right. couldn't pitch two innings on Sunday. You're facing a guy who had 219 hits during the regular season to lead the major leagues. Jimmy Williams isn't afraid to be second guessed. And he stuck with Merker, and Merker got the out to keep the lead and end the fourth inning. And Merker will take the mound. We assume, we're not sure, as Rich Garces begins to warm up down there in the bullpen. But with the lefty Paul O'Neill leading off, followed by two switch hitters who hit better from the left side of the plate, it would figure that Merker will go back out to take the ball to start the fifth inning. And Tina Martinez, the left-handed hitter, is batting fourth. Missing down and in. Now 3-0 and on Troy O'Leary, who has walked and struck out tonight. Red Sox got two runs in the first inning. One run scoring on a throwing error, another on an RBI base hit by Daubach. Led three to nothing. An RBI single by Offerman in the second, who, by the way, is two out of three to go with that good defensive play. There's a strike to O'Leary. Then the Yankees came back with two runs in the bottom of the second and a home run by Brocious to make it a one-run game. No scoring since then as O'Leary lines to right. O'Neill a late break in the catch as he falls on that right side. A broken rib. The right side of his torso and he came down, made the sliding catch and hit hard and the crowd appreciates that effort. You could see the slight grimace on Paul's face when he got up after this sliding catch. And a standing O for Paul O'Neill. You can see the grimace when he lands, too. Watch the face. Mm -hmm. 
What a warrior. With two out now, Stanley takes a strike. Paul O'Neill is as valuable a player as there is in any clubhouse across baseball. Two out, nobody on, and that's ball one. One ball, one strike as they chant Paul O'Neill's first name, Paul Lee, Paul Lee. This is a guy who helps patrol the clubhouse. It's these Yankees to play the game the right way, and he leads by example. Fitting, he would make the catch to end the top of the fifth inning. They love O'Neill here in the Bronx, halfway through game one. Red Sox up by one. The American League Championship Series on Fox is brought to you by Infinity, makers of the all new I 30 Performance Luxury Sedan. It's all the best. Well, a pitching change for the Red Sox here in the bottom of the fifth inning, a 3 2 Boston lead. And before O'Neill leads it off, we go down toward the Yankee dugout and hear from Keith Olbermann. Keith? Joe, the congratulations to Paul O'Neill began even before he got back to the dugout. Chuck Knobloch and Tino Martinez coming out to congratulate him on that painful catch that ended the inning. But the uh, real conversation was with the Yankee training staff. Uh, he was immediately surrounded and quizzed. And the word was, since O'Neill is still leading off this inning, that he feels just fine, which he would probably say even if the rib were protruding. He feels fine to continue, Joe. All right, Keith. Well, if we've seen it once, we've seen it a thousand times. The guy who has a broken rib makes a sliding catch for the second out in the top of the fifth inning. You see the broken rib in St. Pete, Florida. On your left, the second of October, and now the sliding catch. If we've seen it once, we've seen it a thousand times. That guy will eventually lead off the next inning. And here he is to start the bottom of the fifth for the Yankees and he takes a ball from Rich Garces and with all the left handed batters coming up Bob mentioned the two switch hitters sandwiched between the left handed hitting O'Neill the left handed hitting Martinez Jimmy Williams once again says pooey the conventionality <laughs> one ball no strikes Garces you see the numbers you just did terrific out of the bullpen this year for Jimmy Williams. He did a nice job in relief of Merker in that game in the division series came in and pitched two and a third inning of a one hit ball gave up only one run and that scored after he was removed from the ball game. One ball one strike. High delivery and O'Neill fouls it back toward us. And you see so many managers that are so hung up on matchups getting lefty lefty righty against a righty Jimmy Williams has gone the opposite here in the last two half innings leaving Merker in to face Jeter Jeter grounded into an inning inning force out at second base now he brings in the right hander and O'Neill reaches for one and rolls it to Offerman one away We keep talking about Jimmy Williams. Let's hear Joe Torrey talk about Jimmy Williams. I put the Boston Red Sox along with the New York Mets as far as two clubs that have really ha have played tough baseball all year and ha have really gone against the odds, basically. Uh, Jimmy Williams is responsible for that in my mind. He's manager of the year, hands down, uh, because of all the problems he had uh, with his main players. One out, nobody on, and a pitch up and in to Bernie Williams, ball one. Tom Gordon, their ace reliever, out for the year. He's back now, but out for most of the year. John Ballantin played 113 games. Pedro Martinez on the disabled list. Even Nomar Garciaparra on the disabled list. Thin to start out with. And yet here they are. <laughs> one out, nobody on, the 1 0 -oh pitch. There's a strike from Garces. When you talk to Jimmy Williams about his ball club, it's hard to get him to be specific. He says, we've just got a bunch of ball players. These guys love to play ball. That's about as much as you get out of Jimmy. Yeah, he emphasized that these guys are baseball players. It's cleared a lot up for me. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> One ball, two strikes. It's funny. It's such an interesting study because he says what he says and then afterward he'll come up and go look I'm sorry I yeah I, that's just that's just all yeah, I have to say that's right that didn't give you much guys but hey it's just the way it is we're worried about this game right now okay see you tomorrow yep
One ball, two strikes, and Williams takes ball two. And I got a pretty good feeling it'll be the same way tomorrow. Yeah. Yep. You played for the guy. <laughs> well, unfortunately, Jimmy got fired while I was there. I had a lot to do with that. Maybe that's why he doesn't <laughs> talk to him. I guess that's it. it. Must be me. Two balls, two strikes. One out, nobody on on Williams. Billy Davis on deck and Williams hits it into center field. Aaron Lewis, he's automatic in center, two up, two down. I'll tell you, as much as any manager managing today, the one guy that comes to mind when I see Jimmy Williams and the way he handles his team and the press, everybody else is Bobby Cox. Influenced enormously by Cox, both with the Blue Jays, his third base coach. He took over for Bobby Cox in 1986, then returned to Atlanta became Bobby's third base coach for six years and that's uh, it's almost the way Bobby Cox is diffusing that situation with the New York Mets in Atlanta right now two out nobody on and a strike is in Chili Davis have you seen in recent memory a manager manage the postseason better than Bobby Cox no not for two games no oh, really I, I guess the Atlanta series too Aided by that remarkable play by Walt Weiss. You have two starters with saves, Millwood and Smoltz. And he did what fans in Cleveland at least wanted Mike Hargrove to do in game three of the division series against the Red Sox, and that is go for the throat. You've got a two-game lead. The Braves at the time had the one-game lead. And they were really wanting to end the series right there so we brought in guys out of the bullpen he brought in Maddox he brought in Millwood who got a save and tonight in Atlanta he brought in John Smoltz who got the save as Chili Davis grounds back to Garces and so Jimmy Williams brings in the right hander three left handed batters to face Garces a one two three inning first time the Yankees have gone in order Times Square here in New York American League Championship Series on Fox is brought to you by Infinity, makers of the all-new i30 Performance Luxury Sedan. It's all the best thinking. Turns out a pleasant night in October here in New York, and El Duque, Orlando Hernandez, was back to the hill, and here is his night. We said at the top of the show in the scouting report, very much a fly ball pitcher. He's true to form so far in this ball game. It's the outside corner. It's a strike in to Jason Baratek. If you don't know the story, Orlando Hernandez, who defected with seven others on December 26th of 1997, eventually established residency in Costa Rica to gain free agency with Major League Baseball, signed on with the Yankees. Tim talked about it. He's been the most, really the most consistent starter they have had outside of David Wells last year. He was obviously no longer wearing Yankee pinstripes, even though every time somebody asked him, he wishes he was still wearing <laughs> Yankee pinstripes. But Hernandez has been the most consistent, certainly this year, for Joe Torre. And on 0 2, a line drive base hit off the bat of Baratek into right. Leadoff man is on for the Red Sox here in the sixth inning. So another ball hit in the air off of Hernandez, and Bob was talking about that scouting report. Curveballs, fastballs, that four seamer conducive to fly balls. It's the two seamer, the sinker that goes down that gets the brown the ground balls, but of course Hernandez doesn't throw that pitch. So from that, I told you so to another. You know it's a big story now that Orlando Hernandez turned 34 on Monday, not 30 as they report in the media guide here with the Yankees. Mm -hmm. One on, nobody out, and Lewis trying to bunt bunts at foul. Had more people been paying attention to the Fox Saturday Baseball Game of the Week yes. two months ago? Yes. You, sir, Tim McCarver, told the world that El Duque was about to turn 34, not 30. As he took a few years off when he came to the United States. Aided and abetted by Dr. Roberto Echeverria, who is a professor at Yale and wrote a book called The Pride of Havana, a book about Cuban baseball. Matter of fact, Orlando Hernandez played for the Industriales down in Cuba. And that team 
or a team formerly named before the revolution back in the late 50s had been around since 1878 1878 playing organized baseball in Cuba that was two years after Custer's last stand For those of you interested in that type of stuff he says smirking at the 30 year old to his left one ball one strike <laughs> with one on nobody out Bob Costas talked about it during the division series and I thought said it well when he talked about El Duque as Lewis bunts it in the air one hop to Martinez down to second out that's the only play force out three six and with the speed of Lewis they were not going to turn to anyway throw was a little high but the easy put out on the force out just to finish about Hernandez as we watch the replay of this bunt which was bunted too hard right at Tino Martinez and they get the lead runner Baratek who doesn't run all that well because he's a catcher oh please come on knock it off go ahead show me how well he runs Play him close that wasn't his fault the ball was bunted ball too was bunted hard too hard stay off the catchers I know but, but what Bob was saying was it is understandable that somebody like Orlando Hernandez because of the government situation down in Cuba he had a lot of his youth taken away which shaved some years off to give himself better opportunity for a bigger contract for more years with Major League Baseball in the United States and Canada one on one out and the pitch is in for a strike to Trot Nixon which begs the question why only four years I mean if you're going to knock some years off you know, make it worthwhile on your 19. <laughs> I guess El Duque kind of <laughs> kind of thinking that you you better stay within range. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise you can't sell it. <laughs> Come to think of it, I think now my mom is part Cuban. <laughs> She's been knocking ears off her age for the last 10 years. I was going to say, you don't have to go to Cuba to find people who knock years off their no. age. There are a lot of well, people in this country who do tons of them. And it happened in the 30s and 40s yeah. uh, in Major League Baseball. Sure. A lot of players from the South, the rural South, that would tell you one age. And they were actually a few years older than they reported. One ball, one strike on Trot Nixon. Sorry, Mom. <laughs> Starts to rain here at Yankee Stadium in a one run game, sixth inning. And Nixon pops it up into the raindrops, foul left side, and that is strike two. We take you back down to Keith Oberman in the protection of the Yankee dugout. Yeah, Joe, apart from the fact that uh, we are getting drenched here, you're talking about shaving time off. Yankees signed a pitcher named Rollins Sheldon in 1960 who they were told was 21 years old or 20 years old turned out he was actually 23 or 24 so it's it's happened in their team's history before as well thank you Keith it's one on one out here one ball two strikes as Hernandez deals with Trot Nixon rain lets up a bit and Nixon into the ball outside two and two Tim, when you brought that up on the Saturday game of the week, did you get any evil stares from El Duque after that? No. Jose Cardinal, the first base coach and outfield instructor for the Yankees, told me the next day, El Duque's really mad at you. And he said, nah, just kidding. One on, one out. And Nixon is jammed as he tried to get out of the way, and that ball rolls foul. That was a key pitch to make contact as far as the Yankees are concerned. There's Jose Cardinal, first base coach for the Yankees. Had Nixon not made contact with this ball, it's three and two. Darren Lewis is compelled to run at first base. Totally different situation instead of the 2 2 count. Rain stops. Had a brief shower, and now it stopped here at Yankee Stadium. Two balls, two strikes, one on, one out. One run, Boston lead in the sixth inning. Lewis running. Nixon strikes out, throw down, strike him out, throw him out, inning over. Lewis cut down by Posada. What a, what a cannon shot by Jorge Posada. 
I mean a tracer to get Lewis. First double play of the night belongs to the Yankees and we are through five and a half. Mel Stottlemyre, the pitching coach, and Orlando Hernandez speak primarily in sign language. El Duque is not fluent in English. Mel is not fluent in Spanish. But they get the point across. <laughs> A little body English there <laughs> trying right. to indicate. It appeared to be the 2-0 pitch. Where was the 2-0 pitch? And El Duque indicated just off the corner. Tino Martinez swings at the first pitch at the bottom of the sixth inning and pops it up. Offerman and Nixon, and Nixon makes the catch. Offerman peeled away, and Nixon, both were calling for it, was able to throw a glove out and make the catch for the out. You're absolutely right, Joe. He just threw his glove out here. He took his eye off the ball. He never saw that ball coming down. His eyes were down looking at Jose Offerman. He just stuck his glove out, and the ball caught him. Oh, my. <laughs> so a postseason break for the Red Sox. The Bambino must have been sleeping for that moment. Normally luck is a loser's lament. Not in this case. One out, nobody on, and Posada takes a strike from Garces, who has retired all four Yankee hitters he's faced. One out, nobody on, nothing and one on Posada. That's down the left field line, slicing foul for strike two. You see more hitters who can't center the ball against Rich Garces. He is on top of you so quickly. Bubblegum machine going, what's going on? Uh, this just caught my eye a moment ago. That's out in left center field. You can see it out that open door. That's basically our vantage point, an ambulance out in left. It backs away here in the sixth inning at Yankee Stadium. One out, nobody on now, one and two on the hitter Posada. Mentioned Garza has pitched two and a third inning against the Indians in that division series, gave up only one hit, tremendous control in that ball game. Painting that outside corner with the fastball and the slider. Jam Posada and a floater into center field for Lewis. And that's five in a row retired by Garces. With two out, nobody on. We'll remind you that Friday, catch the most original new police drama in years on the series premiere of Ryan Caulfield, year one. And the creator of the X-Files brings you the ultimate mind game, Harsh Realm. It all starts Friday at 8 Eastern, 7 Central, here on Fox. That's Friday night. When this series will take a rest. Getting back up for game three on Saturday afternoon. Roger Clemens and Pedro Martinez at Fenway. You'll need your rest for that one. I was going to say, everybody will need a breather before that one. Spencer is singled, scored a run. Batting with two out, nobody on. And that's two quick strikes from Garces. That's often uh, how you can tell a, a pitcher's effectiveness, not only that he gets hitters out, but how the hitters make outs. Do they hit it sharply on the ground? Do they hit line drives to outfielders? Catcher and pitcher keep the fat part of the bat off the ball. That's their primary responsibility, and Garces does it wonderfully. One ball, two strikes. Garces is trying to go perfect through two innings. Picking up from Merker after four. Tonight's starter. Missing low, two and two. It will be Garces and others out of the bullpen tonight for the Red Sox. Base is empty with two down. Red Sox up by one, and Spencer strikes out. Through six innings in game one, Red Sox up by one. A little luck in the bottom of the sixth inning for the Red Sox and Trot Nixon back after this from your local Fox station. <laughs> 
seventh inning now of game one of this ALCS. Welcome back to the booth, Joe Buck, Bob Brenly, Tim McCarver. We wear these ribbons in support of those stricken with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. Helen Hunter, the widow of Catfish Hunter, dropped the first pitch here tonight. And for those of you stricken with that horrible disease, and for those trying to find a cure, we wear these ribbons in your honor. Helen Hunter watching throughout the ceremonial first pitch tonight with son Todd, son Paul, and daughter Kim, who is seated next to Helen. And one of the most beloved Yankees who passed away earlier this year. Pitched with the Athletics, pitched with the Yankees. Stricken with ALS and baseball, lost a good friend earlier this season. As the pitch is up and in, one ball, one strike. To the leadoff hitter in this lineup for Boston, Jose Offerman. Derek Lowe, who has been solid out of the bullpen for the Red Sox this season and in the postseason. A little stumble in game five, but it didn't cost the Red Sox in the division series. Starts to loosen. So it starts to rain again here at Yankee Stadium as we begin the seventh inning. I can't be safe. Offerman flies into right center field. Pretty well hit. Bernie Williams a long run. One away. And Offerman is two out of four. Williams, who made a couple of terrific catches in the division series against Texas, including one in game one when the Yankees won eight to nothing and Bernie drove in six runs. It's a rather routine catch. One out. The batter is Valentin, who has doubled, reached on a fielder's choice in an error and scored a run. We saw El Duque drop down on that first pitch here to John Valentin. He has not changed his arm angle in this game as much as we anticipated. Dropped down to throw a slider here. First pitch to the Red Sox third baseman. Misses just off of the outside corner. Dropping down there and hitting the outside corner. One ball, one strike. When El Duque drops down like that, there is no way for the ball to go down. It has to stay on an even plane. So what would normally be a curveball going down turns into a slider in effect, breaking parallel to the ground. Valentin out in front. That's strike two. The report initially was we would have rain here in New York, but after the game. 10:36 here in the Bronx, but the rain came early. <laughs> Weatherman thought it was a day game. One ball, two strikes, one out, nobody on. Valentin fouls another. I made a sarcastic comment one time on a Cardinal broadcast. I said, now I'm no meteorologist. I'm far too qualified. But it doesn't look like it's going to rain for much longer. Well, you have never received a letter <laughs> any nastier from any group out there than from this one meteorologist who was speaking for the entire group, and it was nasty. Ooh, thank you, doctor. Two balls, two strikes now on Valentin. The gentleman came prepared. Old man in the sea, right out of him in my mind. The 2-2 two -two pitch. Valentin hits it well into right. Back is O'Neal at the wall to make the catch. Two down. And O'Neal had about one more step before he was pinned up against that blue wall. Yet another fly ball out for Hernandez. Two in this inning. He has 14 fly ball outs during the game. None on the ground. As Paul O'Neill makes the catch rather easily. And you got to believe Joe Torrey and his staff and the trainers for the Yankees were holding their breath as O'Neill went back closer and closer to that right field wall. Gene Monahan, the trainer for the Yankees, watching as with two out, nobody on, Daubach, the number three hitter, takes a ball. Rain lightens up a little. Daubach, the Belleville Basher. Belleville, Illinois, just across the river from St. Louis. 21 home runs, and this is rookie season. Finally got a shot and certainly made the most of it. 
Dangerous situation right here. 2-0 to a pull power hitter. Looking for the pump. Two balls, no strikes. Two and one. Garcia Parra, who has been held hitless tonight, but has certainly made his presence felt, saving at least three runs defensively. Waits on deck. There are indications that managers and pitching coaches look for, and when a power hitter fouls back a fastball on a 2-0 count in the seventh inning and fouls it back the other way, that's a good sign, a sign he's still throwing well. Base is empty with two down, and Daubach pops it back here. Two and two. Some of these fans here at Yankee Stadium get a head start on the seventh inning stretch. Left center field, Williams to his right. And the Red Sox go in order in the seventh. Time to stretch here at Yankee Stadium. Game one of the ALCS. Brocious now block Jeter due up for the Yankees. They trail Boston by one. has gone seven for the Yankees a group effort tonight for the Red Sox Merker for four Garces for two and now Derek Lowe third pitcher of the night for the Red Sox outstanding numbers for Derek Lowe on the season you see the low hit total a power sinker say 15 games on the season a very odd combination for a pitcher he throws a hard sinker and an overhand curveball generally sinker ball pitchers complement that pitch with a hard slider breaking the opposite direction Low features a big overhand curve to go along with that sinking fastball. Brocious, who has been a handful tonight for the Red Sox with a two-run home run and a triple, leads off. Takes a strike. Each time through the order, Jimmy Williams giving the Yankees a different look. The left-hander, Kent Merker, and then the over-the-top, Rich Garces, who throws a slider, and as Bob said, now the sinker curveball. And that was the curve there. Tomorrow night it's Ramon Martinez for the Red Sox, and you would figure it'll be another long night for the Red Sox bullpen. Sure. Guy who lasted five and two thirds innings in his division series start in game three. Hard hit through the left side and a leadoff base hit for Brocious, who's three for three. Tying run is on to start the seventh inning for the Yankees. Uh, Derek Lowe just got a little bit too greedy on the 0-2 pitch, threw a sinker over the heart of the plate that Brocious was able to line through that left side. See, Valentin hobbled by that bad knee, really cuts down on his lateral range at third base. How many times do you see a team trailing by a run and a hitter in their lineup missing only a double for the cycle? Home run, triple, and single for Scott Brocious. And now what do you do with Knobloch? Is he up there to bunt? I think so. Run up? I think so. I think he's straight bunt right here. Which he does, and it's a perfect bunt. Low makes the play and out at first with Offerman covering. And the sacrifice is good, 1-4. With a tying run down to second with one out here in the seventh inning after this. Sometimes you have to play it straight up because of the people that are coming up behind the guy you butt with. And with the meat of the order, Derek Jeter, Paul O'Neill, Bernie Williams coming up, Joe Torre properly, in my opinion, playing it straight. I agree, Tim. That's the right move to make, but it had to be tough for Chuck Knobloch, a guy that's six for 13 this season against Derek Lowe with a home run. Wow. Now Jeter. Jeter had a chance with two on. Yankees down by a run in the fourth inning. Rounded into a four shot. That was against Merker. Against Lowe, he takes a strike. Number five on the all-time Yankee list. A 318 career average for Jeter. 
in a Yankee uniform. To the right side of base hit. They bring Brocious around third. Throw by Nixon to the plate is dropped. Safe. Tie game and down to second is Jeter. With the parents of Derek Jeter watching, the base hit into right, a strong throw by Nixon, and Veritek dropped it. Boy, are you ever right. That was a terrific play on the part of Trot Nixon because Jeter doesn't hit it that well. Fielded well on the short hop and a good throw to Veritek. That was not an in-between hop. That ball was right there. Broach just crashing into Veritek. I think uh, what happened, Jason, looked like he took a peek at the last minute as Broach just came into him. And by taking a peek at the runner, he dropped the ball right you, there. You could see Veritek's head start to move to the left to pick up Broach just coming down that third baseline. Just a split second before the ball got there. Bob, I think it's epidemic with Major League catchers who are wearing their mask when they protect home plate. The one thing that the wearing the mask does, it cuts down on your peripheral vision. When you're looking to your left, you're seeing bars, not the runner. And Veritek had the mask on, and Broch just knocked it off. See a lot of major league catchers trying to block home plate with their mask on, and to me, it's not the proper approach. You don't get the proper look at the runner, and it costs Veritek here. And most runners coming into home plate don't go for your head anyway. That's they right. go for the glove. That's they try right. to jar the ball loose. Now the go-ahead run at second, only one out for Paul O'Neill. Strike one. The Red Sox, who have only one left-hander in their bullpen, Real Cormier, have Derek Lowe on the mound. And it'll be one lefty after another to the plate for the Yankees, and it's the right-hander, Tom Gordon, getting loose. And he just started to throw. The Yankees now a hit away from taking the lead. To the left side, and Garcia Parra kicks it. Can't handle it, and O'Neill's safe at first. Second error of the night for Garcia Parra. Uh, looked like the ball came up on him just a little bit, hit the heel of the glove, and jumped up in the air on Nomar Garcia Parra. At that point, he thought he still had a play on Paul O'Neill. He finds the ball, makes the play, but can't find the handle the second time. That allowed O'Neill to reach first base. The defense behind Derek Lowe in the postseason has been awful for the Red Sox. Go back to game one of the division series. The error by Valentin followed by a two-out game-tying two-run home run from Jim Tomey. Baratek just dropped it out at the plate, and Garcia Parra makes an error to put two on with one out and Williams grounds to short Garcia Parra out at second bad throw and saved by Stanley no double play and it's first and third two out the ball was not hit that hard and what that did it gave Paul O'Neill a chance to get down on top of Jose Offerman and perhaps cause the bad throw Nope, Offerman had a clear shot, dropped on the back end. You know, Boston turned the fewest double plays in the American League this year, mostly due to the fact that Jose Offerman has a lot of problems making the exchange and getting that ball off to the first baseman. Everything looked good at that point, but Offerman just spikes the ball into the ground. Nice job by Mike Stanley to block it over there, prevent the run from scoring. I think in fairness to Jose in this particular instance, that ball took too many hops to get to Garciaparra. Uh, it would have been a, a, a masterful job of turning a double play. So the inning lives on. First and third, two out in a 3-3 game, seventh inning, game one, American League Championship Series. Chili Davis at the plate. 
to put the Yankees out in front for the first time tonight takes a strike from Derek Lowe. We could talk for a day about the talents of these two, Derek Jeter and Omar Garcia Parra. Each are in the error column tonight. Garcia Parra two times. Jeter with a hit that tied this game here in the seventh inning. There's a ball inside to Davis. One ball, one strike. With the rain pounding down in the seventh inning. Davis gets a good rip. It fouls it back, strike two. Now with Davis in the hole and two outs, the Yankees don't use this play very often. They don't try to steal a cheap run. But since Davis is in the hole, you might see Williams run, stop getting a rundown, and try to score Jeter. They did it in game one of the divisional series against Texas last year with Chad Curtis on at third. Jeter and Williams, the base runners for the Yankees. Davis fouls another. Chili Davis, who has been in the LCS last year with the Yankees and 87 with the Giants, 91 with Minnesota. There's a total of seven RBIs in LCS play. This would be a big one here with two out in the seventh inning. Hernandez settling down on the mound for the Yankees. Pedro Martinez cheering from the Red Sox dugout. Runner at first goes, and they pay no attention to Bernie Williams. Two balls, two strikes on Chili Davis. That was a planned play. Neither Garcia Parra nor Offerman covered on the play. Veritek not throwing and just giving Bernie Williams second base. Now a single could score two. It is a steal for Bernie Williams. Second and third, two out. The 2 2 to Davis. Foul. Tag toward the top of the upper deck. Hit up in the lights. <laughs> a sinker just off the inside part of the plate. And with two strikes, Chili Davis is thinking protect the plate. He hit that one in the hot dog stand. Two balls, two strikes. Davis 0 for 3 tonight. Inning over. Derek Lowe keeps it a one-run inning. It could have been a scoreless inning. A dropped ball at the plate by Veritek, and the Yankees have tied it. Through seven in game one. Yankees three. Red Sox three. We get into the eighth inning now, a 3-3 game. Action for the Yankees out in their bullpen. Jeff Nelson is the right-hander, Mike Stanton the lefty. We go back to that throw by Trot Nixon, which in retrospect was a sensational throw. You want to talk about getting every part of your body into a throw. Watch Trot Nixon after he lets this go. He's airborne. <laughs> and it was a strong throw to the plate on one hop. Veritek just didn't hold on to the ball. The mask come flying off there at the end of the play. That was the tying run in the bottom of the seventh inning. Now here in the eighth, it's Garcia Parra to lead off against El Duque, who has retired nine of the last ten. And there's strike one. Nomar's going to see that pitch again. It would be dead wrong for Hernandez to try to come inside to Garcia Parra in this situation. Too quick. 1999 led the American League with that 357 average. 1998, 30 plus home runs in his first two years in the major leagues. One of the game's biggest, brightest stars. For rookie of the year in 97. The two ball, one strike pitch has popped up. Behind the plate, Posada gives it a look. Has a play a basket catch one out and a big threat is gone as Garcia Parra fouls out to start the eighth how about that he did bust him inside with a fastball and that wind once again brought that ball back 
Jorge Posada paying attention to what happened earlier to both Veritek and Martinez. Now, normally you would tell your catcher to run back to the wall, find the ball, and then make an adjustment. But because the wind is blowing, you see Posada just kind of glides on it. He knows that ball is going to come back somewhat. It makes the basket catch. And now O'Leary grounds the first, picked up by Martinez. Two up, two down. And the heart of the order is going quietly as... Hernandez now is retired 11 of the last 12. Used to be in baseball that the third baseman and first baseman would always be on the line in a tie game from the seventh inning on. The managers are more selective right now. The Joe Torre putting Tino Martinez over there properly with the pull hitting O'Leary. And that saved the double for the Red Sox. And now Scott Broch is playing a couple steps closer to the third baseline. Stanley takes ball one low and away approaching 110 pitches on the night is El Duque here in the eighth inning with two out nobody on the bottom of this eighth it'll be Martinez Posada and Spencer numbers on the night for Hernandez who gave up two in the first one in the second and nothing since then two up and in two and oh pretty good pitch. Two balls, no strikes on Stanley. That's a strike on a breaking ball. Two to one. Stanley singled back in the third. One out of three on the evening. And that's hit well into center field, but not deep enough. Is approaching the track. Williams puts it in. Doug Leather and Stanley is gone. A 1 2 3 inning in the eighth inning for Hernandez, who is really pitching well. Bottom of the eighth, still tied at three. The American League Championship Series on Fox is brought to you by Smooth Refreshing Michelob Light, Beer or Michelob. By MasterCard, MasterCard, proud sponsor of Major League Baseball and fan of the Great American Pastime. By 1010 321, now just eight cents a minute for calls over 10 minutes. And by the people inspired to build vehicles for your mind and heart, Nissan Driven. Bottom of the eighth inning now, and Orlando Hernandez, after getting through the top of the eighth, gets a handshake from Mel Stottlemyre. Looks like El Duque is finished as Rivera cranks it up for the Yankees out of their bullpen. Tino Martinez leads it off against Derek Lowe and takes ball one. 3-3 three, three game, game one of the ALCS. Martinez, Posada, then Spencer. Scheduled hitters in this inning, and that's ball two, two and oh. It looks like Rivera is warming up to come into the game, whether the game's tied or the Yankees are ahead. Certainly will be in it if they're ahead. Three and oh from Derek Lowe to the leadoff hitter in a tie game eighth inning. for the Red Sox in their bullpen as Lowe finds the strike zone three and one. <laughs> Joe not quite as animated as Popeye in that shot. Martinez with a full count three and two. Getting some encouragement from Don Zimmer Martinez two out of 14 this postseason. Is cleaning the mud out of the spikes. It's been raining here at Yankee Stadium. 3 2 pitch is strike three called over the inside corner. From a 3 0 count, and Derek Lowe comes roaring back to strike out Martinez looking. Don't forget that tomorrow it's game two of this ALCS. The Red Sox and the Yankees at 8 Eastern. Vaughn Martinez will pitch. For the Red Sox against David Cohn. Then Friday, it's game three from here in New York, Shea Stadium. The Braves and the Mets. Braves up two games to none. That's on NBC. 
One out, nobody on, and here's Posada, and there's a big rip and a foul. Might be saying at home, how can a power hitter like Tino Martinez in a tie game take a fastball on a 3-2 count right down the middle? What I think happened was Gary Blow appeared to jerk that ball. A lot of pitchers will do that. Martinez looking outside, and Derek came across his body, and that ball tailing back over the inside corner, or even a fatter part of the plate. Something in the look confused Martinez. Speaking of looks, the opposite end of the spectrum with regard to Derek Lowe's windup compared to that of Orlando Hernandez. The breaking ball is low from low, two and one on Posada. Here's that three two pitch. You can see even Baratek is set up outside, but this ball is jerked inside and came over the fat part of the inside corner. Posada up on the count, two balls and a strike. And a ground ball to Offerman. Backhanded pickup. Two up, two down. A little different look from Derek Lowe as he winds up and brings it to the plate. Very economical, keeps his body over his legs, which may sound funny, but a lot of pitchers, as they go into their windup, will rock back and then step into their delivery. Dick Cole, who was the former pitching coach here in Boston, Cut down on his delivery to home plate, told him to keep his upper body and his head over his legs. You see that very unusual sidestep, and goes right into his windup. Now it's Joe Kerrigan. In his third season with the Red Sox, former pitching coach for the Montreal Expos, where he helped tutor Pedro Martinez, who is also now with Boston. Spencer strike one. It's a very odd look for a tall right-hander, six four and a half, to keep the right leg stiff and throw the ball down in the strike zone as Lowe does. Raining as hard now as it has at any point tonight. It's 0 and 2 on Spencer. Man's head for cover. Two out, nobody on at the bottom of the eighth inning of a 3-3 game. Game one of the ALCS. Spencer takes ball one. Shane a single, a run scored. He struck out twice since then and faces low for the first time tonight. Spencer went. Tried to check his swing. He's run up, rung up by Dan Morrison and can't believe it. So a 1 2 3 inning for Derek Lowe. We go to the ninth inning. Tied at three. Through eight innings now in game one, a 3 3 score. And with the rain continuing to fall, although it's letting up at this moment, Mariano Rivera takes over in the grounds crew. Feverishly spreading that. Diamond dust, or whatever that junk is they throw out. <laughs> here's cooperation. It's all about cooperation in this world, isn't it? And here's the ball boy for the Boston Red Sox. Not Ash, but just helping. And we appreciate that. The ground crew here at Yankee Stadium does not use that turpus. That's that junk that Joe referred to. That's what it's called. On opening day this year against the Detroit Tigers, it was raining so hard that they had to use 10 tons of turfus. 10 tons. 10 tons. Tons. 10 tons. That's a lot of turfus, <laughs> isn't it? Well, they've completely rebuilt that mound out there in the time it took Mariano Rivera to get in from the left field bullpen. That thing's as high as it was when Gibson was pitching. <laughs> 15 inches high. It's 1968. <laughs> a 1.12 ERA. Denny McLean, 31 wins. Here's Joe Torre talking about the growth of Mariano Rivera as the Yankee closer. Watching him grow uh, after doing an outstanding job in, in 96 as a setup man to grow into the role he has now has been really fun to watch. He's He's no longer thinking of strikeouts, even though he's very capable of striking everybody out. Uh, and, and he's been very economical with his, with his pitches. But as far as taking him for granted, 
uh, it's nice to know that you have them in your pocket when the, when the eighth or ninth inning comes around and you have a lead. Well, no lead tonight, but it is the ninth inning, and Joe Torre goes to a guy who this season saved 45 games, and you go back over his last 30 appearances, he is unscored upon in any of those last 30 appearances, including the two postseason outings he had in the division series against the Rangers. The one thing you can do, if you do get someone on, you can run on Rivera. It's a big if. Yeah, that's right. He does not allow many base runners. You see the numbers on Mariano Rivera this season, the 45 saves. 52 strikeouts in 69 innings. That number could be considerably higher. You heard Joe Torre say he doesn't necessarily go for the strikeout all the time unless he really needs it. So here is Rivera just trying to keep it tied. It's 3-3 in the ninth inning of game one. Baratek is jammed. Easy play for Nabla if there is such a thing. And we listen to Jimmy Williams talking to his first base coach Dave Jouse about running on Mariano Rivera. Davey. We run on this guy. Yeah, he's about a 1-4. Yeah. I mean, it's a good pitch to throw on. The only thing is it's a good pitch to throw on because it's I up know. in the zone. And, like it's hard. And hard. Yeah. He's a real good fielder, but he does not quicken up. He doesn't like to throw over. I got, throw I got, one. I got a butt. I, I believe that. Yeah, um, okay, I just asked. Yeah. Talking about exactly what you two were talking about and uh, all the words out. And that's no secret that nope. you can run on Rivera, but... As uh, Bob pointed out, easier said than done. If you can get to first base, then you can run. And what Jimmy said at the end there, I've got a bunt. That's provided Veritek gets on. Then he was going to use a straight bunt with Darren Lewis. But it didn't happen as Veritek was jammed and he grounded the second. And now with one out, nobody on. A one ball, one strike count on Darren Lewis. Trot Nixon will be next. Balls and a strike on Lewis. We'd like to thank, of course, Jimmy Williams and Joe Torrey for wearing microphones in the dugout, something that no manager likes to do, but willing to let us in to their dugout. Three balls and a strike from Rivera. That's a sacred place, isn't it, the dugout, when you're talking about things that happen during a game or things that happen away from the ballpark? So Torrey watching with interest on a 3-1 pitch. Full count on Lewis. Well, Lewis is a guy, should he reach base, that is certainly capable of stealing. I was thinking the same thing, Bob. You're right. And you heard Dave Jow say that Rivera is tough to run on because his pitches are up high in the zone. Got him over the inside corner. Two down. So two up, two down as Rivera bounces back from a 3-1 count. Plus, with all the rain now, it's almost a quagmire around first base as Rivera's fastball gets Darren Lewis. Turfusmeyer. Turfusmeyer. I always preferred kitty litter myself. <laughs> I know that about you. <laughs> two out, nobody on. Here's Trot Nixon. He has made his presence felt with I would think even Trot would admit a lucky catch out in right and then a terrific throw but if it had been better handled by Veritek at the plate may have kept the Red Sox out in front as it was Veritek dropped it and they hit by Jeter Rocha scored to tie this game at three in the seventh inning Rivera having a hard time keeping his throwing hand dry right now out there on the mound. See Nixon wiping his sleeve over his helmet. The rain will drip off the bill of your helmet. Still 0-2. Fans are tough. Only a few have left for the cover of the concourse. Nixon pops it foul into the upper deck down the right side. Yeah, baseball is a secular religion in the Northeast Corridor. They hang in. 
Maybe ruin a leather jacket or two. The program. As they watch Rivera with a count of 0-2. Deal to Nixon. One ball, two strikes. The Yankees in the bottom of this ninth inning. We'll have Brocious, who's three for three. Knobloch and Jeter. Nixon stays alive. Tough mayor around these parts. And a big Yankee fan. Here's the question. If it were raining like this over at Shea, would he stay? He wouldn't be in that cap. <laughs> Bases empty, two down, and Nixon grounds back to Rivera. Inning over. A one, two, three inning for Mariano Rivera. Scott Brocious, who is perfect on the night, will lead off for the Yankees. Bottom of the ninth inning, game one. Tied at three. Well, away we go in the bottom of the ninth inning. I've been playing clips from the movie Rocky earlier, the movie Rudy. They're breaking it all out here at Yankee Stadium. Rivera, a scoreless top of the ninth before the bottom of the ninth inning. With Brocious set to lead it off, we take you down to Steve Lyon. Steve. Uh, guys, it might be interesting to know that Scott Brocious coming into this at bat needing just a double for the cycle is from McMinnville, Oregon, where it rains about nine months out of the year. So if anybody in that Yankee lineup is used to hitting in the mud and rain, he can smell a hit coming. <laughs> <laughs> well, Steve, it has never happened in postseason play, a player hitting for the cycle. He is homered, tripled, singled, and scored, and he lacks only a double to accomplish that feat that's never been done in the postseason. We look at our game summary. We're all the way into the bottom of the ninth inning. Boston got two runs in the first. Derek Jeter error figured in heavily. Offerman an RBI single in the second. It was 3-0 Boston until Brocious hit a two-run shot with two out in the bottom of the second, a one-run game until Brocious scored on a base hit by Jeter on a ball that was dropped at the plate by the catcher Veritek. Tied it at three in the bottom of the seventh, and now here we go into the bottom of the ninth inning. Derek Lowe is in the dugout with, you just saw the jacket covering his pitching arm. And they're going to work on the field, on the base paths, and we will take a quick break. Possibly, possibly not. It depends on how quickly this grounds crew, which is known for dancing the YMCA between innings, can pick up the rakes and sprint off the field, which is always a dangerous thing to do when the ground's wet. The guy's an artist. And they're going to bring more of that stuff out. Remember that number, 10 tons. They're deacon low here. <laughs> he came back out, was going to warm up, and now here they come with more bags. All right, let's take a commercial. We'll come back. You won't miss anything. We promise. I knew. We welcome you back to Yankee Stadium. There are 4,000 people on the field trying to get this field ready. We take you back to the construction of Yankee Stadium, which began May 5th of 1922 for a ballpark that opened on April 18th of 1923. They've added to the upper deck down the foul lines, at least in fair territory, since they first put Yankee Stadium together. The house that Ruth built, they crammed 74,200 in this ballpark at one time. They had bleachers out in the outfield benches eventually it grew out beyond the foul lines down each side you see the upper deck down the right side the first game here at Yankee Stadium April 18 of 1923 and we talk about the history of this rivalry and how these two franchises are intertwined they defeated the Boston Red Sox in 1923 when with Babe Ruth in their lineup they beat Boston April 18 35 World Series, 30 championship fights here at Yankee Stadium. 1958 NFL Championship game, the Colts and Giants. 
called the greatest game ever. Two papal visits. And we will read the newspaper at the time. April 18, 1923, Yankee Stadium opens today. Red Sox face the league champions. Men's suits, Men's suits 45 to 78 bucks. <laughs> Stock exchange back then. The low mark in 1923, and you look at the players, including Babe Ruth. And while we talk about the ironies, the way these two franchises are intertwined, not only did the Red Sox open this ballpark, but the New York team, called the Highlanders at the time, the very next year became the New York Yankees, opened Fenway in 1912. Finally, the grounds crew is finished. You look out at the retired numbers and eventually Monument Park, which was put together back in 1932. The rain has stopped. We talk more about this rivalry and the Red Sox indeed playing second fiddle, at least after Ruth was sold to the Yankees. First meeting in 1903. Finished one and two 12 times with the Yankees finishing on top of the Red Sox nine of those 12 times. The 1978 one game playoff for the ALE's title, the Bucky Dent home run off Mike Torres. The 1941 Ted Williams hits 406. DiMaggio, the 56 game hitting streak, and Joe D won the MVP. While we say the name Joe DiMaggio, you will notice on the left sleeve, Scott Brocious as he digs in, the number five in tribute to the late Joe DiMaggio who passed away this year. And the black armband in tribute to Jim Catfish Hunter. Finally, after all that, a roll of the third that's foul for strike one and we're underway in the bottom of the ninth inning. And with all the turfus that's been dumped onto the infield area, footing figures to be very treacherous. That, that composite will absorb the moisture, but it gets clumped in the cleats of the base runners and the defenders. A one ball, one strike count now as that misses outside to Brocious. Who again, <laughs> you look at the spikes of Jason Veritek. Again, Brocious lacks only the double to hit for the cycle. A nasty pitch down and away, strike two. Also, the outfield is very wet. No turfus in the outfield, so when that ball hits, if it's a line drive, it's going to scoot and make it very difficult to pick up if you're an outfielder. Brocious leading off in the bottom of the ninth inning, a 3-3 game, the one-two pitch. Just got a piece. If that ball does skip in the outfield, you may be looking at the first guy to hit for the cycle in the postseason. Ten Yankees have done it in their storied history. Here is Brocious, who has homer, tripled, singled in that order. Cormier and Beck are both ready. And that came back for strike three. One out. Brocious doesn't agree with a call. The late call by McClelland, and that's strikeout number four for Derek Lowe. Well, you remember that pitch to Tino Martinez that tailed back over the inside part of the plate. This one did the same thing, same side of the plate, only a right-handed hitter up there. And late tailing fastball, a very effective pitch. Now Knobloch, who has grounded out, flied out, walked, and dropped down a sacrifice bunt. Jeter next. That hits the inside corner. Jeter tied this game his last time up in the seventh. The RBI hit the right. Not blocked on his backswing. May have come back and hit the catcher. Baratek, so he hopped out of there. The 0 1. Strike two. See if Lowe tries to hit that outside corner with that comeback sinker once again. Started just off of the outside corner. Try to tail it back in there and get the called strike.
The 0-2 pitch from low. Got away with one there. That was a real hanging breaking ball. I think what saved him, the pitch was too high for Knobloch. You see Jason Veritek laying his catcher's mitt on the ground, telling his pitcher, get it down, get it down. He left that pitch up over the fat part of the plate. Again, the 0-2, and Knobloch just got a piece. Rain is all but stopped. A little missed here in the ninth inning. This rivalry, these two teams meeting for the first time ever in the postseason. Wouldn't you know, game one is a 3 3 tie in the ninth. Big numbers in his career for Knobloch against Low. Valentin a diving stop. Too late, base hit. And the winning run is on for the Yankees. Great play by John Ballantin. What? Look how quickly he gets to his feet. Just missing the speedy knoblock. Looked like after Ballantin made the catch, as he was diving, he was able to get his body turned and in a better position so that he was able to get to his feet quickly and throw strong to first base, but knoblock was just too much speed. Another thing on a breaking ball away, a right-handed batter gets down to first base a lot quicker than if he were jammed. And that helped Knobloch get a good jump out of the box. Knobloch may have injured himself coming across the bag, and he will get a visit from Gene Monahan and Joe Torre as Jose Cardinal is in on the meeting. I think what he did was jam that right foot in making sure he was safe. It's the left foot. And coming down on the right foot, it didn't appear there that... Trainer Gene Monahan looking at the right foot of Chuck Knobloch. A bit on the trip down the baseline. Yeah. Knobloch is okay to stay in, and he carries the winning run in his back pocket. Derek Jeter stands in. Just had the Derek Jeter cereal <laughs> unveiled last week in Manhattan. That's, that's a Jethro Bodine cereal bowl right there. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's Proceeds go to the Turn 2 Foundation, which promotes healthy lifestyles for teenagers. It's available regionally, <laughs> including the states of Michigan and New York. From Michigan, Jeter has been a hero so many times, and he takes ball one down and in. Troy O'Leary in left field playing Derek straight away. Center fielder Darren Lewis drifted toward right center field. There's a big area in left center. To the third baseman, Valentin, fires to second to get the lead man, two gone. Knobloch is forced. A good play to keep the winning run out of scoring position, and Jimmy Williams with O'Neill coming up. He's going to go to the only left-hander he has in his bullpen, Real Cormier. Chuck Knobloch, bad foot and all, going hard for first into second base to make sure the Red Sox were unable to turn a double play. And that's in for Derek Lowe. As Knobloch goes back into the dugout gingerly, Lowe did another fine job for the Red Sox. He keeps it tied here in the ninth. Strong effort again tonight for Derek Lowe and for this Boston bullpen. The numbers for Lowe as he hands the baton to Real Cormier, the only left-hander for the Red Sox in their pen. Jimmy Williams has to be very judicious about his use of Real Cormier, but this figures to be as good a time as any. A tough left-hander in Paul O'Neill coming to the plate. He brings on his only left-handed reliever. Tomorrow, it's game two of this ALCS at 8 o'clock. The Red Sox and Yankees, David Cohn against Ramon Martinez. Then Friday night on NBC with Bob Costas, Joe Morgan, Jim Gray, 8 Eastern, Game three, Braves and Mets at Shea Stadium with the Braves up two games to none. This is game one of the ALCS, and it's 3-3 in the bottom of the ninth inning. Winning run at first. 
Good speed as Jeter will take his lead, and Paul O'Neill stands in. O'Neill, a 190 hitter against left-handed pitching this year. Facing Cormier. And he takes a ball. The big question for the Yankees coming into this series, was O'Neill healthy enough to not only stay active on the active roster, but eventually to start in this opener of the ALCS, a broken rib on his right side. He could be the hero of game one. One on, two out. Tie game. And a strike makes it one and one. Neil, a mild argument with Tim McClellan. So the Red Sox in a game started by Kent Merker. And the influence of the Red Sox bullpen tied with the Yankees here in the ninth inning. If we go to the tenth inning, it would be the top of the order for Boston Offerman, Valentin, and Daubach. Anybody gets on Garcia Parra, and it would appear it would be facing Mariano Rivera. Nobody warming for the Yankees, so Rivera will be back out there in the tent. That's another thing by bringing a left-hander in. You do two things. You suit him up against Paul O'Neill, batting only 190 against lefties this year. And you keep Derek Jeter closer at first base with the left hander. Winning run Jeter at first with two out here in the ninth inning. Looks like he's running here. Cormier gives him a look. Track conditions sloppy. Rained heavily here the last couple of innings. The rain is now stopped. But more mud than dirt on the infield. Jeter with his lead. One ball, one strike on O'Neill. And the crowd is starting to get all over Cormier. Well, it's... Shaky footing not only for base runners, but for the infielders as well. If Derek Jeter breaks for second base, he may have problems with his footing, but so will Jose Offerman and Nomar Garcia Parr as they break to cover the bag. One ball, one strike on O'Neill. That's strike two, and Cormier and the Red Sox one strike away from sending this to the 10th. That pitch was hammerable. Fastball on the fat part of the plate. Ken Merker doing a good job against Paul O'Neill, keeping the ball away earlier. Mariano Rivera. Rivera has worked two innings in a, in a game only three times this year. And none more than two innings. Feet of Derek Jeter as he takes his lead. One ball, two strikes on O'Neill. That's foul. And a nice pick on the other end by Jose Cardinal. You know, we always show Don Zimmer, and he's a big character in the dugout for the Yankees. Jose Cardinal is as big a character. Not only do you get a character, but you, you get that look from Don Zimmer, which the cameras just seem to find him. Yeah, it looked like Zimmer was giving Jose Cardinal a hard time. Absolutely. After throwing that ball up into the stands, he made a face at it. Jose, of course, being politically correct there, throwing it up. <laughs> one on, two out, one ball, two strikes on O'Neill. Two and two from Real Cormier, who has undergone Tommy John surgery. Took him. 
over a year to feel right again. Came up through the St. Louis organization. New Brunswick, Canada. The guy who would chop wood in the offseason to stay in shape. He's still in that business. Trying to break O'Neill's bat. Two balls, two strikes. One on, two out. Tie game, ninth inning. Do it again. Well, with their outfield defense, the Red Sox are certainly anticipating Paul O'Neill hitting the ball to the opposite field. See the center fielder, Darren Lewis, way over into the gap in left center. And Trot Nixon in right field, several steps over into the gap in right center. They're giving O'Neill a lot of room just to the right of center field, also down that right field line. Also playing a step or two deeper than they would normally play to prevent a double. Because if a ball gets by an outfielder, Jeter's going to try to score. Another 2 2 pitch. That's twice now in this at bat. But just before a pitch is delivered, there's a wild note played on the organ here at Yankee Stadium. Whether intentional or not. But it has escaped from the organist here at this historic ballpark. That whimsical Eddie Layton on the organ. It's only happened twice. Two balls, two strikes. Winning run at first with two out. Ninth inning. Game one, ALCS. Down the left field line, slicing into the seats. Parmier's going to have to do something different. He's given O'Neill the same look too many pitches in a row. And you can see slowly but surely Paul is hitting the ball back over the third base line, or third base dugout, and then he's bringing it around toward that line. Got to mix it up a little bit and then go back out there. Looked like Joe Kerrigan was talking to Jason Veritek and telling him perhaps to go out and talk to Cormier about that very thing. That's the problem is if Cormier wants to come inside on O'Neill, you better make sure you get it inside right. where he can't hurt you because, as we mentioned, the outfield defense is set up for Paul O'Neill to hit the ball to the opposite field. If you make a mistake on the inside part of the plate and allow Paul O'Neill to pull it, there's a lot of room down the right field line and in right center. O'Neill dried off the bat, gets back in with a 2-2 count. Switch hitter Bernie Williams on deck. Winning run at first, two out, game one. Back to Cormier. Let's go to the 10th. Extra innings in game one. Red Sox and Yankees. Top of the order for Boston in the 10th inning. Which seem Rivera will head back to work in a 3-3 game. Mariano Rivera does indeed head back to work for his second inning of relief help for the Yankees. We go to the 10th inning tied at three and we go down to Keith Oberman. Keith. Joe, Chuck Knobloch will go back to work here in the 10th inning as well. The injury that we saw in the last inning was not on the uh, play at first base, but the foul ball rather that he jammed off the back of his right ankle above the calf or barely above the ankle. I'm getting my, uh, I didn't get my medical degree as you can tell. Trainer Gene Monahan was watching him throughout and will continue to do so, but uh, Tommy said he was all right to go out again. Nope. So he's back in the field, and so is Rivera. And again, Mariano Rivera, who has thrown two full innings three times this season, has never gone more than two innings in 1999. Will work to the top of the order. And then if this game should continue, more decisions for Joe Torre. Rivera only threw 14 pitches in that ninth inning. So if he has a, an economical 10th, perhaps Joe would send him out there in the 11th. Uh, unless the Yankees, of course, score in the bottom of the 10th. Be sure to stay tuned to Fox for your late local news immediately following this game. For those of you who want more coverage of tonight's game, turn to your local Fox Sports Net or Fox Sports News. But right now it's the 10th inning. Game one of this ALCS tied at three and Jose Offerman two out of four leads off and is overmatched with strike one. 
Offerman, Valentin, and Daubach. Feeling we'll be seeing a few of those throughout the next week and a half. One ball, one strike. Lines a base hit into right field and a good start to the 10th inning for Boston. Well played by O'Neill on that wet grass out in right. And it's a leadoff single. Third hit of the night for Jose Offerman. That's the good news. Here's the bad news. The right-hander that the Red Sox try to score against here in this postseason game has been basically untouchable his career in the postseason. A record of 2 and 0 an ERA of 0 0.47 nine saves he hasn't given up a run since that Sandy Alomar Jr. home run back in the division series in 1997. Here's Valentin it was reached on a fielder's choice scored a run and doubled. John Valentin has sacrificed one time only in 1999. You almost have to bunt here, though. I think you play it straight up just like uh, Joe Torrey did with Chuck Knobloch setting up uh, the tying run back in the seventh. And Rivera with that throw to first base, not so much to try to pick off Jose Offerman to see if John Valentin would give away whether he's going to bunt or not. He's not, and that's strike one. Now, these are unusual circumstances. Yep. First of all, you're in game one of the ALCS. More importantly, you're facing Mariano Rivera. You've got your number 300 Dahlbach on deck. If you can avoid the double play and get that runner down to second, then you can get Nomar Garcia Parra to the plate. And they're swinging with Valentin, and the count's 0 and 2. First base runner for the Red Sox since a leadoff hit in the sixth inning by Veritek. And it's Offerman with a leadoff hit here in the tenth. You may remember in our sounds of the game a couple of innings ago when Jimmy Williams was talking to first base coach Dave Jouse about Mariano Rivera can you run on him they determined that it would be tough but it can be done and they said at the time Rivera does not like to throw to first he's made two throws over there in this at bat and now Offerman starts and stops Posada lost control of it as he popped up that pitch didn't miss the strike zone by much one and two even though Rivera is a one speed pitcher that's one of the things that running against him will do because Jorge Posada has a very difficult time centering the ball when Rivera releases that fastball. He had two pass balls earlier in the year. He didn't lay a glove on him. The ball's hit him in the forearm. The one two. Two balls, two strikes. And 96 in from Rivera. In order to make a clean throw to second base, you have to you have to catch the ball cleanly. The ball can't be caught in the heel of the glove or the webbing of the glove. It's got to be caught in the pocket to make the transfer properly. Go ahead, run at first with nobody out. Offerman starts and stops and a ground ball to third. Down to second, out. They call him out, and we are going to get an argument. Jimmy Williams comes firing out of the dugout. They say it was on the transfer, and Offerman is forced at second to put out 5-4. And with Valentin running, the Yankees just missed a chance for a double play. No way, in my view, was he in the act of throwing. That ball popped out of his glove. He never even touched the ball. There was no transfer from the glove to the hand. We'll check it out. Ball came out of his glove. He never went in to... He was never in the act of throwing. That's a very poor call by second base umpire Rick Reed. Knobloch never had control of this ball. It hits the glove and comes out immediately. No control in the glove, no control in the hand. 
Used to be a cheer in Brooklyn and went. We was robbed, and the Red Sox was robbed then. Chuck Knobloch, who committed 26 errors during the regular season, just had a terrible year defensively. That's a boot. If Knobloch would have had his bare hand closer to the glove, perhaps he could have made this play. Look how far away from the glove his bare hand was. No control in the glove whatsoever. None. Well, we have yet to show you a replay where it looks like it was anywhere close no. to being an out. Yankees with a huge break right there. So instead of two on with nobody out, it's the go-ahead run at first, and Daubach gets it back to Rivera. It's Jeter in the middle this time in a double play. 1-6-3. And what a turnaround. What a turnaround in a matter of minutes. Yankees catch a break. Still 3-3, bottom of the 10th. Back to Yankee Stadium. The Bud One Airship is overhead here in the Bronx. The Brewmasters at Budweiser remind you that fresh beer tastes better. Budweiser, the official beer of Major League Baseball and the American League Championship Series. The raindrop on the lens up. The camera on the Bud One Airship, and now it's... Rod Beck takes over in the bottom of the 10th inning. He's the fifth pitcher of the night for the Red Sox. Beck came over from the Chicago Cubs for left-handed pitcher Mark Guthrie and minor league third baseman Cole Liniak at the trade deadline. Pitched in his first game on the 1st of September. He came into the ball game. Jason Baratek, his catcher, came out to the mound and very politely introduced himself. Hi, I'm Jason. What do you throw? First time they'd had an opportunity to talk to each other. Rod Beck picked up a save in that first outing. One thing he doesn't throw that he used to. Just the three sure things around here. Red Sox trying to break that curse. The one thing he doesn't throw is that overpowering fastball like he used to. Watch the velocity on the Fox box in the top left hand corner of your screen. That's about as hard as he'll throw with any pitch maybe 88 maybe 89 but probably won't touch 90. So if that's the case, you do not want to toy with Bernie Williams in there with an 87 mile an hour fastball. That's his strength. A shot into center field. Back, track, wall gone. And with that, the Yankees have won game one of the ALCS. You could see Jason Baratek setting up inside to pitch to Bernie Williams. It looked like a high inside part of the plate fastball. Not for long. We'll find out. Let's go down to Keith Oberman. Keith. Bernie, congratulations. Couldn't have come at a better time from you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was due. I was trying so hard during the, during the course of the game, and I was just able to get a good pitch and put a good swing on it. Did you, uh, as Chef Nelson says hello, the speed of the pitch, we were watching Beck not at full velocity. Is that where you want to pitch in that situation at that speed? Well, I was just looking for a pitch out over the plate. He threw me a cutter at uh, the first pitch, and uh, I thought they were going to work the end. So uh, I just didn't want to pull off the ball, try to stay inside, and uh, I got my pitch, and I put a good swing on it. Bernie, we won't say that was a missed call second base in the top of the inning or the bottom of the last inning the top of the inning but it's a, a call that goes your way as opposed to Boston's way when when that happens with the Yankees do you feel like you have to take advantage of that situation well there's no doubt about that I think we had a couple of opportunities during the game that uh, we could have capitalized and we didn't and uh, you know in series like this you need a break like that to get it going so we're just very fortunate and uh, very proud to win this game are you glad you signed with this team rather than the one in the other dugout right now? Well, I like where I am right now. Bernie.
Johnny, congratulations again, and thanks for stopping by right here. Thank you very much. Joe Buck, back to you in the booth. All right, Keith. As we what? take you away, Tim, watch this one being driven away by Bernie Williams. All you have to do is look at Jason Veritek. The right foot plants. He sets up inside. Wrong place to pitch, Bernie Williams. Bernie Williams, who was the ALCS MVP in 1996, has a leg up on it in 1999 with this swing. Game one, which lasted until the bottom of the 10th inning. Rivera gets the victory. Rod Beck takes the loss. Two pitches into the bottom of the 10th inning, and Bernie Williams sent it over the wall in dead center field. That'll do it for game one. Game two tomorrow night, 8 Eastern. Ramon Martinez will take on David Cohn, the Boston Red Sox, the New York Yankees. This harsh rivalry. The Yankees and Red Sox hooking up in the postseason for the first time in postseason history in round one of this ALCS goes to New York for Tim McCarver and Bob Brenly and Keith Doberman and Steve Lyons. This is Joe Buck so long from Yankee Stadium. Final score in 10 innings, 4-3, the world champions win game one. Join us tomorrow night for game two of the American League Championship Series beginning at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific. What a night here at Yankee Stadium. Will the curse continue throughout the end of the millennium? That's what we'll be tracking over this next week plus of this LCS with the Yankees and Red Sox. Don't forget, you've been watching Fox Sports coverage of Major League Baseball. A long night, a good night for the Yankees, and a good night from us to you. This is the place where champions are crowned. Where legends are made and dreams come true. This has been a presentation of Fox Sports.